it would take a lot, I think, for the ECB to, to stop normalizing from where we're at. The ECB has kind of backed into pretty dangerous territory here and, and arguably is on the precipice of a policy mistake. They're hoping they can hike without triggering an even deeper downturn, but that's very much an open question. I think the risk of the markets is that we talk ourselves into a recession. The ECB is an incredibly tough place. All central banks are at the moment. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together this Friday with Katie Lines. Bramo back on Monday. TK Futures down a third of 1% on the S&P. It's the end of forward guidance. It's the end of forward guidance. We can talk about that and launch forward next week to a very important Fed meeting. But, John, we've got to do, uh, you know, what, what I see on the data screen right now is the shocking speed that we see in curve inversion. It's just absolutely stunning how we revisit new greater inversion this morning. What I see in the economic data over in Europe, Tom, it's pretty dreadful. The PMI is a downside surprise. That's not what you want to see. The day after we've had a 50 basis point hike, check out Euro dollar, 101.57. Euro dollar negative seven tenths of 1%. Kit Jukes and Co over at SockGen still calling this one, Tom, unbuyable potentially through the rest of this year. Well, and it's on the GDP as well. I think, you know, they, they've become massively data dependent after, I guess, what we saw yesterday. We'll talk to Jim Karen and others about it as well. Obviously, the market's not impressed. John, you and I saw that surge in euro turns right back around, boom, down. And where we go from here, it is about economic data wrapped against, as Lagarde mentioned yesterday, the just original politics. Hey, Tom, isn't it good news that we go meeting to meeting and stop pretending that we oh, know what's going to happen in the you're, future in on, Europe? You're getting me going, John. It, isn't that good news? You, you know where I am on this. <laughs> well, tell me, would you make a Snapchat coming out and say no forecasts, no guidance? We don't know I where just, we're going either. I just said to Matt Miller, the conflation of tech as tech is just yeah. baloney. There is profit-making tech, and story stocks. Kaylee, can we take a macro signal from the outcome of Snapchat earnings? You might be able to in that what they're talking about here is advertisers pulling back on spending because the macroeconomic environment is deteriorating. They are falling victim to that in a big way. But are they going to be a bellwether for Twitter later this morning, for Meta, for Alphabet, huge mega cap stocks, that report next week? And also I thought was interesting in those <clears throat> snap results, they're slowing hiring. How many times have we heard that over the last couple of weeks, John? Microsoft killing job openings. Kaylee, I have to say, though, isn't that the goal? Isn't that the objective of Fed policy? Isn't this ideally what they want, job openings to be reduced, just take some demand out of the labor market? Yeah, cool it off a little bit. In theory, yes. The question is, are they acting so aggressively that by the time the data catches up, we're seeing not just a cooling, but outright destruction in the labor market? And as we talk about where Fed funds ultimately needs to get to, where does unemployment need to get to in the scenario in which the Fed rate is high enough to get inflation under control? The one thing in corporate comms that got my attention yesterday and actually worried me, Tom, was AT&T coming out and saying that yeah. people effectively are delaying paying their bills. That's something worth paying closer yep, attention I to. I agree. I agree. It's a tea leaf out there. I would suggest also they have a little bit of competition with True. the guys in Magenta uh, and, and all that. I just take massive issue, John, of media conflating Snap with name your big tech stock making gajillions of money. I, I just... They're two separate worlds. Big but tech we've seen it in next Meta. week. Go on, Kaylee. We've seen it in Meta already, Tom, not just in terms of the advertising headwinds in general, but also those Apple privacy changes. They've been weighing on that stock for a long, long time, and that's one of those big tech companies. Snap right now down about 30%. I'm going to whip through the price action. Kelly's going to go put through me the in day the lines ahead. Time I, I think out, she Jerry. tried to. <laughs> I, just, you know. I think she tried to briefly. Can I go Futures home now? down about a quarter of 1% on the SP on the NASDAQ. We are lower by a half of 1%. Yields in six basis points on a 10 year, 281.42 on never a 10 do year that. right now. Now, Bramo would double down even harder than that. You got that right. Euro dollar 101.55. <laughs> Katie, euro dollar negative three quarters of 1%. All right, I'm going to try and get myself out of the doghouse with Tom Keen with this morning brief. We got a lot going on this morning, 6.30 a.m. Eastern time. So just about 25 minutes from now, we're going to get a decision from the Bank of Russia. We have already seen 10 and a half percentage points of rate cuts from April to June. We're expecting another 50 basis points today, although our economists here at Bloomberg Intelligence think the cut could actually be 75 and that the central bank is going to raise its growth forecast, lower the inflation one what a turnaround for the Russian economy compared to what we thought the outlook was when they first invaded Ukraine. Then at 8 a.m. Eastern, we're going to get results 
from Twitter. Just the results. There will not be a call because, of course, there's all that drama going on with Elon Musk. Will he be forced to buy the company for $44 billion? Looking at a share price of around $39. Doesn't look like the market believes it. But, of course, we'll be paying attention to what the advertising revenue and daily active users look like for Twitter. Are they falling victim to the same forces as Snap, where actually users are better? They're just not able to monetize them as much because advertising is slowing down. And then finally, at 9.45 a.m. Eastern, some U.S. economic data. We'll get the prelim read on PMIs for the month of July. We're expecting on manufacturing to fall down to the 52 level. But of course, we've seen a string of downside surprises in the economic data over the last 24 hours or so. John, that is in part why we're seeing a big rally in the bond market. So will we see a follow through on the weakness in Europe when it comes to those U.S. PMI members later on? Kelly, thank you. Pushing forward to that and looking at Treasuries right now, you would slower by five or six basis points. This range we've traded in in the last 24 hours, the high of yesterday's session, 3.0. <laughs> 8%, right now 280. Jim Karen joins us, the Chief Fixed Income Strategist at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Jim, that's a 27, 28 basis point trading range and without a major economic data release. What do you make of that? Well, to me, what it looks like is that we're at an inflection point and markets are essentially trying to figure out if they need to follow the nominal growth or the real growth. And the nominal growth, which has been, you know, reasonably positive, but when you adjust for inflation, um, the real data is actually looking very, very weak. And we're seeing PMI start to slip below or slip near critical uh, threshold levels, and there's all the survey data that's suggesting that. So with a lot of cash in the system right now, people are very, very skeptical as to where to go. I think the bond markets have been places where, well, they've sold off, yields have gone up, and, and it's, just, it's, it's just attracting some buyers at this point because there's just a lot of uncertainty out there. Jim Karen, you go right where I'm thinking about this weekend, which is you go to the sugar high of inflation. That would be Tang and the sugar high that you get from it. And there's a point after the third Tang where it doesn't work. Discuss the nominal joy we're seeing right now versus the real real of 2023. Yeah, so, so I think it's interesting if we just put a couple of data points together, right? So we all know that wages have been rising, nominal wages have been rising. But if you look at real wages, meaning adjusted for inflation, when you subtract out inflation, they're down 3.4% year over year. You know, we recently had a retail sales number that was a month over month number, which was pretty big, positive 1%. But then we also had in the same week a, a, a CPI month over n month number that was 1.3%. So when you sub subtract out the 1.3 from the 1%, your retail sales is actually at negative 0.3%. So what that means is that people are starting to buy less goods, but they're paying more money. This is going to start to weigh on inventory adjustments, which is going to weigh on GDP. This is not good for profit margins. This is not good for earnings. So the real data is actually telling us you know, forgive the pun, the real story, mm. which is that things are starting to slow down more materially than maybe what many uh, many in the markets are thinking. Okay. And certainly the nominal da data doesn't suggest. What does that mean for the Fed then, then, Jim? Because what they are trying to achieve is a demand slowdown. If that is already starting, does that mean they're not going to have to go as far? Yeah, so that's the crux of the matter, Kaylee. And, and I think that, no, they will go as far. And the reason is, and this is what's different this time, the Fed is hiking interest rates into a known slowdown in the markets. This is something that they don't normally do. I think they only did this once in the past 50 years, and it was in the 1970s. This is almost unprecedented. So the Fed sees this as an inflation problem. The Fed sees that they have to bring down inflation at, 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 this, at this stage. And I think fully they're willing to go 75 basis points in, in July, possibly you know, 50 to 75 in um, in September. And they're going to keep going up to, in my view, up to about 3.75% or maybe even a little bit higher by early next year. So despite the fact that we are slowing, are we slowing enough to actually get inflation to where they want it to be? And I think the answer to that at this point is no, they're not. So I think they're willing to be aggressive, even still, even in the face of this weakness. So what do you make of the easing of financial conditions we've seen in the last couple of weeks then, Jim? What do you think their reaction to that will be? So, you know, I, I'm a little bit uh, mixed on this one because I think people are very happy about the fact that, oh, maybe interest rates have stopped going up. Look at what's going on along the yield curve. Tom was just talking about that. Um, but 
and I understand that when interest rates go low and people think that they're going to be somewhat stable, that people start to move into growth equity and that starts to bring up the equity indice prices. People start to move into high yield. High yield spreads have started to come down. People start to look for yield because they believe that the thrust higher in interest rates is over. But what I think they're not thinking about enough is why are rates going down? They're not going down for good reasons. They're going down because the economy is actually slowing. So I see this as a little bit of a sugar high. I see this as a, uh, oh, okay, rates have stopped going up. I'm very, very happy about that. Let's go buy something. But, oh, why are rates going down? For not very good reasons. Maybe I should rethink this. So I'm a little bit skeptical on this rally at, at this point for those reasons. Jim, let me squeeze this one in. After the news conference finished yesterday with President Lagarde, what did you and your team say to each other? Just the first words that left your mouth. What were you thinking? Uh, I, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, there was just very, very little uh, detail that was put into this uh, transmission protection instrument that it really made it seem like they just opened the door to say, look, we're going to hike interest rates, yeah. uh, but we have this other tool in case there's a problem, and it's a big tool. Uh, don't worry about it. We got it. The ECB clearly yeah. wants to live in the moment and govern that way. John, uh, Jim, I like what Marcus Ashworth said. Uh, at Bloomberg, writing in Bloomberg in, in opinion, TPI to protect Italy. I thought That's that was all awesome. this about. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, Jim, it's great to catch up, buddy, as always. Jim Karen there of Morgan Stanley Investment Management. But good morning to you. Uh, TK, that seemed to be the takeaway yesterday after that ECB oh, News conference. Please. People's heads just spinning. My head was about to explode. If I hear TPI <laughs> too many times today, I think it's going to go that John, way, Tom. A family member, uh, a, uh, an acquaintance of a family, I should say, had a monograph from 1945 in Oxford of Jean Monnet. Nothing's changed since then. Since then, still There's confused. Nothing more than the political confusion off the memory of World War II, and it's a mess. I thought Lagarde did well yesterday, uh, given all the conflicting politics she faces. Euro weaker, euro dollar negative three quarters of one percent. Futures down just a little bit after a decent run of gains on the S and P. We're lower by a quarter of one percent from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. U.S. social media giants are on track to lose $69 billion since yesterday's close. Disappointing revenue from the parent of Snapchat raised concerns about the outlook for online advertising for the whole sector. Snap sees a major slowdown in the ad industry and the company's planning what it calls a substantially reduced rate of hiring. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo warns that the U.S. can't keep relying on Taiwan for semiconductors. In a virtual speech to the annual Aspen Security Forum, Raimondo said Congress needs to pass legislation to support the domestic production of high-end computer ships. She called the $50 billion package, quote, a Sputnik moment for America. In the UK, a new poll shows Foreign Secretary Liz Truss extending her lead over former Chancellor Rishi Sunak in the race to be the next Prime Minister. According to a YouGov survey of Conservative Party members, 62% said they would vote for Truss and 38% went for Sunak. An earlier poll this week had Truss leading by 19 points. Turkey says an agreement to allow shipments of Ukraine's grain will be signed today in Istanbul. Ukraine, Russia and the UN will sign the accord. Ukraine's grain shipments have been largely stalled as its ports have been blocked since the Russian invasion. That's led to predictions of an increase in world hunger. And one of Elon Musk's top executives at Tesla is the subject of an internal investigation. Bloomberg's learned that Omid Afshar is being looked at for his role in a plan to get by hard to get construction materials. He's the executive who runs the company's Texas factory. Tesla has already fired some employees in connection with the matter. Meanwhile, terms of Afshar's departure are being worked out. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We decided to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 50 basis points and approved the transmission protection instrument. We expect inflation to remain undesirably high for some time, owing to continued pressure from energy and food prices and pipeline pressures. Go back to bed, get under the covers, the ECB. Is hiking interest rates. Christine Lagarde there, the ECP president. Or maybe go back to sleep because 
you know, that's what it felt like in the news conference at times yesterday. Tom, oh, it was not a snooze as, fest. as they worked John, through please. TPI. TPI. I hung on every word. I bet you were. Did you even carry that news conference on radio? We did carry the news conference. How much and then of it? We were very, How much well, of it? Oh, I don't know, 90 seconds. <laughs> and then we were very, very fortunate to have Marcus Ashworth to join us and really break it uh, down. I think He's there great. was a lot of really good comment across all of business media. I think what Martin Arnold uh, did today in the FT was great, John. And guess what? As we heard from Jim Karen, it's a big so what. It needs to be tested. And when it's tested, good luck with that. I think B of A said from whatever it takes to whatever. Yeah. After yesterday's meeting, we'll futures see. down it's by original. a third of one percent on the S and P. On the Nasdaq, we're lower by six tenths of one percent. Katie's got a lot to say about what's happening with tech names. We'll get to that in a moment. We're down six basis points on a ten-year stateside. The Bund market. Let me just tell you where ten-year Bunds are, and we'll build on this later. We're down 19 basis points at the front end. The two years down 19 basis points. Euro dollar negative eight tenths of one percent. Tom, the PMIs out of Europe today were just terrible. Yeah. Just well, let's be upfront about it. They were just bad. 23 basis points on the German two years. What I see, 0.45 uh, percent, and that shows the transatlantic divide uh, that we've got. We've got a divide in Washington as well. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew briefs us uh, right now. Joe, I don't want to do the postmortem on this conference. Everybody's doing it. This, that, everybody's got a political view. I want you to answer for our domestic and our international audience. What's the so what here? Where is this? in September or December or in the history books. If you're talking about the January 6th committee, uh, come September, apparently we could get more hearings. We understand last night there from uh, members of the committee, more witnesses are coming forward, more evidence. Liz Cheney says it's the dam that's beginning to break. Here's the thing, timing is a real problem here. We were supposed to get a final report from this committee imminently. Last night was originally going to be the grand finale. Now we know it's not. There'll be likely more hearings come September. So they're going to drop an interim report. What happens if Republicans take control of the exactly. House in November? They're going to dissolve this committee and they're going to turn it around and investigate the investigators. I, That's I, where you're going, I, right? I want to know outside. Joe, you're really good at this. You get outside the beltway. It's hard to believe, folks. But he hasn't taken all the Kool-Aid yet of the tang of Washington, <laughs> D.C., Joe, what's the so what of this in the history books other than Democrats feel this way, Republicans feel that way? Well, look, if you're talking about sedition and witness tampering, if that's actually provable uh, from this White House, that's a big deal. The committee has two different purposes. One is to set the record straight. Uh, you're a history buff, Tom. We want to know what actually happened to keep it from happening again. <clears throat> then separately, there's the matter of legal action, and that's going to come down to the Department of Justice. They are conducting their own investigation. It's just unclear exactly how, if this committee actually dovetails with that investigation and if they're providing information in the end. Liz Cheney wants to. Benny Thompson, the chair, says that's not their job. They just are here to set the record straight. Merrick Garland can do what he wants. But it's going to be an interesting bit of timing here because this could all be concluded on the eve of the midterm elections. Well, to that point, Joe, and you mentioned Liz Cheney, she's feeling the heat from deviating with her party here. At least Adam Kinzinger yep. isn't seeking re-election, so he can't feel that burn. I mean, how much does this influence voters in November? Well, with regard to her own race, that you know, it's it is its own thing in in Wyoming, and a lot of people are wondering how many Democrats might actually vote for Liz Cheney. But look, she could be in big trouble. She could also be setting herself up for a presidential run down the road. That remains unclear. With regard to the midterms themselves, though, you, we we started this segment talking about interest rates and inflation, and that's where the conversation is going to begin. That's where decisions are going to be made at the ballot box. It's not going to be likely driven by what this committee is doing. All right, Joe, obviously the other news that hit the wires yesterday was that President Biden has tested positive for COVID-19. I remember when yeah. President Trump tested positive in October of 2020. That was a completely different moment in the pandemic, completely different in the news cycle. It was all we could talk about for days because we didn't have <clears throat> advanced vaccinations or treatments yet. That's right. It doesn't really seem like anybody's paying that much attention. He's doing fine. Yeah, well, a lot of people are paying attention here. I mean, you're dealing with an almost 80 year old man and there are obviously uh, some concerns about his health. But the White House was quick to, to kick out images. And then, of course, the video of the president uh, to reassure the world that he's fine. He is isolated in, in the residence and apparently working hard. Every image is he's behind the desk and doing something here. And that's the way this goes. But the, the messaging from the White House is really uh, so, uh, striking here as as we as we look at where we were a year ago today, Joe Biden was in a CNN town hall and he said 
that you won't get COVID if you take the vaccine. Hmm. And fact checkers played with that at the time. Yesterday in the White House briefing room, Corrine Jean-Pierre said, we expected this was always going to happen with regard to the president becoming infected. We never heard that before, not directly, but also sooner or later, everyone is going to get it. That's the first time I've heard that from a White House official, certainly in this administration that was partially elected to beat COVID. Joe, we'll catch up with you in the next half for sure. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew down in Washington, D.C. Tom, if there was a sign of progress around this pandemic, wasn't it this in the last 24 hours, to Kelly's yeah, point, the well, way it was treated? Yeah, Lauren Sarr is going to join us here, but I just think it's really, really bad medicine. If you get vaccinated, that does not diminish the opportunity to enjoy COVID. What it means is when you get sick, you get much less sick, particularly with the double uh, boosters. John, what I note there is, you know, the president gets COVID and everybody goes nuts. I got COVID. I didn't even hear from you. I got nothing. Yes, you did. I, I mean, <laughs> don't, don't say that. You, yes, you did. You know, Every single you, day. Okay, you sent me a fruit I, I basket. I called you multiple times a day to check in on you. <clears throat> Please. Don't even start. I'm not even going there. Futures are down a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down six tenths of 1%. Yeah. This weakness in the euro is something we've got to sit on. Yeah, OK, sit on it, please. 101. We're down three quarters of 1%. The data out of Europe is just bad. <clears throat> and for those yeah. people out there saying you're going to talk us into a recession, I'm not talking anyone to anything. <laughs> just look at the economic data out of Europe right now, Tom. It speaks yeah. pretty loudly, pretty clearly. John, can we get ready for the real yield this afternoon, folks? It's not as good as the crypto show, but we do enjoy it. I, I agree. And, thank you. Yeah, thank you. The real <laughs> yield here. I just want a victory lap for Priya Misra. We hit zero, negative 0 0.25. 25 basis points of inversion yeah. at about 4 a.m. this morning. John, this is the banner. Folks, on radio, the banner says, halfway to Priya Misra. John, I never thought I'd say that this quickly. She was looking for negative 40. I believe she still is. She thinks maybe the inversion can go wow. more deeply than that, arguably because rates have got to go up more and the front end's going to suffer. Tom, that's the view of Priya and the team over at TD. Features are down a third of 1%. Crude, 95.29. We're down a little more than 1%. From New York this Friday morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Three-day rally on the S&P 500. Actually a decent winning streak. You tally it up. We're up big time on the week by about 3.5%. Futures right now down by about a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down a half of 1%. Katie's going to go through the social media stocks a little bit later on. But Dan Ives of Wedbush already out this morning saying, don't look at Snap. Snap is a paper plane in a windstorm. And what you want to look to are things like Google and Facebook <clears throat> next week. We'll do that. In the bond market, this is what we're looking at right now. Big range on a 10-year Treasury. Yields right now, 281.97, pushing 3.1%. At the highs yesterday, yields come in five or six basis points. Look out for the PMIs a little bit later this morning. Look out for the PMIs a little bit earlier this morning over in Europe and check out how Europe is trading. Just look at the bond market in Germany. Yields in 22 basis points on a two-year. 22 basis points after the ECB just hiked 50 basis points and teed up another move in September. The euro negative three quarters <laughs> of 1% 1 at 101.55. And Tom, the data out of Europe, ugly. Let's yeah. put it that way. Well, I'm to pick a word, ugly. And Marcus had a nice chart today in Bloomberg Opinion. Go, I'll, I'll get it out on Twitter, folks. Marcus doing a great job. John, the GDP, real GDP hurdle there is totally different, radically different than the United States. The inherent dynamism isn't there, even though everyone you and I know, John, is going to Paris. And the big number uh, one it's, shock, it's, Tom, I know you're complaining because you want to go to Paris. <laughs> the number one shock that we face in the second half could be a negative supply shock. And what could happen here, given the communication we got from the ECB, can you imagine this, Tom, that you get a shutoff of gas from Russia or a near shutoff, and this ECB ends up hiking rates because of the inflation story that comes uh, yeah, off the yeah, back of that? I mean, talk dependent. about hiking Come into on. a mess. Tom, you say they're data dependent. Fine, they're I'm exposed. with you. They are, totally. For you to understand what they do with the data, you have to have a decent understanding of their reaction function. And if you don't understand uh, that, that it's all meaningless, Tom. You sit there, you say you're data dependent, then you cherry pick the data and what it means to you. I look at reaction functions now, John, just like I look at the sharp risk-free rate. I mean, what is it? What's the risk-free rate right now? In Germany. Let me know. Your 10-year right now is 1%, if that's what you're talking about on a risk-free rate, Tom. I'd even go, you got to go short-term papers and anchor, and I just, I don't know. I mean, I'm looking at the two-year yield about ready to go negative uh, in, in, in Germany Plus 46. As well. We're getting there. 
Are you done or what? You keep bringing new stuff up, so I keep giving you numbers. Okay, give me some numbers. Continue. What more do you want? I want. What do I want? I'd like a ticket so I can watch the Real Yield this afternoon. You can come the and anchor the, the show set. if you like. Folks, you got to see this at the Real Yield. They've got chairs lined up like three rows deep. There's a gallery. It's like you know, it's a Foo Fighters concert. There's a gallery. And they got the gallery thing going, and everybody wears the ticket. You know, the Real Yield ticket, and they take it home and. Would you and, like uh, to anchor it today? Because it's going to be a hot one. And I'd like no, to play I, golf with Brian I'll, Levitt. I'll be, uh, <laughs> let's go to Brian Levitt right now, who's got a really, really sharp, scenario-based mid-year view. And Vesco does that so well. We should point out Levitt of Michigan is not on speaking terms with our Emily Wilkins of Michigan State. They've never spoken and sort of walked by each other carefully. Brian, I, I want to go to your wonderful mid-year review and scenario analysis. How do our listeners and viewers do scenario uh, analysis given those so many uncertainties, including war? I mean, I think you, you need to look at it from the perspective of the, the cycle is challenged. We know that um, high inflation and policy tightening raises the prospect of a pretty significant slowdown and, and, and even some indicators in the bond market suggesting a, a contraction. Now, um, so that a mild recession is is certainly in the offing. Um, but at the same time, the market has priced in a, a decent amount of it. I wouldn't say all of it, a decent amount of it. You're starting to see inflationary pressures or at least inflationary expectations come down, which could start to provide some clarity on policy and set the stage right. for for a recovery. Brian, let's get to uh, July 27th here right now. You have a fabulous chart in your deck showing the distinctions of the four central banks, who's tightening, who's not. How alone is Jerome Powell after what we saw yesterday with Christine Lagarde? Yeah, I don't think he is alone. And, um, you know, policymakers in the Western world are going to need to do more, unfortunately, to bring inflation down. And, you know, I heard you talking about this coming into it. They're now raising rates into a slowdown in the United States, certainly, and, and unfortunately in Europe, even worse than that. One of the places where you are seeing policy ease um, is China. And so China's had back-to-back -back rough years in the market because of the regulatory environment and, and because of zero covid and so easing policy in China is a, is a tailwind, whereas we're still in the Western world grappling with the headwind of, of ever tighter policy here. Okay, well, talking about those headwinds, as you say, they're hiking into a weaker economic environment. The bond market seems to be having a war with itself for that reason, Brian. Yields keep trying to go up because rates are going to go up, but at the same time, that concern mm. around a potential recession or very least a slowdown is keeping yields capped. Where is your assumption about if we've seen the peak in yields and if that means you actually be want, want to be buying bonds here? Yeah, I, mean, I, I believe that we've probably seen the peak in yields. Uh, I mean, the way, the way it plays out when you're in a recovery and expansion, and we were certainly in a high nominal growth environment, interest rates move higher, equity valuations adjust. What you're seeing now is short rates, which have moved up a lot since last fall, um, and may need to go a bit higher depending on where the Fed goes, but long rates start to stabilize and even come in amid expectation of lower inflation and slowing economic growth. So what worries me is investors see their statement and they see that, you know, if you think of it in terms of 60-40, the 40 didn't work this time. Well, this is a very unique pandemic cycle in which we had a rate adjustment, but I wouldn't be selling my government bonds or my uh, quality municipal bonds here. Duration's likely to be your friend in a slowdown. Is growth in equities also your friend in a slowdown, Brian? Yeah, defensive, higher quality growth of your businesses tend to do well in a slowdown. It's the recovery expansion phase of the cycle where you want to be very cyclical. When you slow down, more economically sensitive parts of the market tend to tend to do less well. So investors that have been piling into <clears throat> things like energy and materials yeah. um, probably are doing it at somewhat near the high, whereas more growthier mm -hmm. businesses tend to do well when they don't require as much economic activity. Brian, over the weekend, strategists have to write about a mini bull market. On the Bloomberg screen, 12 months trailing, S&P and Dow are above a correction level. They're down 8%, 7%, 12 months trailing. I mean, there's a point where you have to blink and say, should I be more in equity, more on board, more a level of enthusiasm? Where are we right now in that mix? 
It probably depends a little bit on the time horizon. If you're if you're buying now, you're probably not all that unhappy a couple of years from now. Do we have more room to go here? Yeah, I, I suspect we do. We haven't seen the traditional market bottom indicators flash, whether that's a whether that's a VIX at 40 or put call ratios higher. There's probably a bit more room to go. We've had the valuation adjustment. Now we we likely need to adjust for some earnings pressure. But the way I tell people, if you think of the um, average peak to trough decline associated with recessions, the last 10 recessions, it's 31 percent. Peak to trough, the S&P did 23.4. So we've done a good amount of what the average is. And average is live because it includes 08, 73, 01. I don't think any of us expect severe recessions like that. So if it's a more mild variety one, um, yeah, there may be a little bit more room to go. But, um, you know, you don't have to get the bottom as an investor, even buying halfway or more than halfway through for long term investors pays off very well. OK, so if there may be some more room to go, let's talk about the room to go for the dollar, because right now it's heading for its worst week since May. Is the peak in, Brian? I would suggest probably not. I mean, the, the dollar has responded to um, a move by the European Central Bank. I mean, you look at the dollar indices, they're going to be trade weighted. So the euro is going to be a big part of it. And um, ECB raising rates more than expected leads to an adjustment in the dollar. But, you know, the, the currency is going to flow to where it's treated or capital is going to flow to where it's treated best. Um, and the United States, um, yeah, we, we have some challenges on the economic front, but but certainly not as severe as, as what you're seeing in, in Europe. So still think the dollar is likely to be strong relative to, to its larger trading partners. Would you make a life in asset management, Tom? Wake up early, do an interview with us, go and play golf at 11 o'clock. Is that attractive to you? Hey, I'm, playing yeah, I'm playing golf you know, with clients. You know, with clients, of course. You know, they're course. taking 200 basis <laughs> points per year. You know, it's like it's easy. Brian Levitt of Invesco. You go play golf with clients. I know. Brian, thank you so much. On a Friday, Tom, just perfect timing to go and play golf with clients. Can you see me on a golf course? I can't. You used to caddy, though, didn't you? I caddied big time. Uh, people will know Oak Hill Country Club, where Lee Trevino won the U.S. Open years ago. Very that cool. Was one of my uh, hangouts. Um, and actually, there's scenes in Caddyshack that are hilarious. But um, <laughs> no, I, I, they would, they would like pay me to leave the golf course if we did like. Do you make much money, TK? Uh, playing golf? No, caddying. Cad yeah, I did because I could keep it from Nelson Rockefeller. It was great. It was all cash and. Good for you. you know, I was rich. It was. <laughs> I, I was. It was in my ute. It was many years ago. Time ago. John, can we talk airfares? You know, you of talk course about we can. By all supply means, and take demand. Your Everybody's Spin the living wheel. this. It's absolutely crazy. I heard from Bramo. She's on her way back. It's. It's been, I guess, really interesting. Cutter Airlines from Kathmandu round trip business class. Sure. It's the only way Bramo goes. Is cheaper than New York to Paris. I find that just this is business that just class, says everything right? about demand. This is business class. Yeah, well, what do you think? It's Bramo. What do you no, think? I'm just, I'm just asking to make sure because you didn't specify. Tom, this raises an important question about the back half of this yeah. year. This summer, they've been able to charge what they want and people have been buying the tickets. I get that. We've been asking I, the question as to whether they can repeat the act later this year. And I see him coming down a little bit. I had, to buy a, I, I had to buy a soiree to British Columbia yesterday that was... Uh, not for me, thank you. But that was actually on the edge of reasonable. Thank you. Oh, really? It came down yeah. a bit. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine, Air Kirby. You know, it's, what can I say? What's what's that? Air United. Kirby is United Airlines. Okay, yeah. Scott Air Scott's Kirby. airline. They've been good. I'm with you. They've been, you know, I got to admit. Are we naming the airlines after the CEOs uh, now? <laughs> yeah, I, okay. John. I called him up yesterday. You know, I got him in two hours. I thought that was pretty That's good. That's not bad. You just stayed thank on hold. <laughs> Futures down two tenths on the S&P. Honestly, getting in touch Scott, with these cool come centers, on, we got to talk. Sort it out. It's ridiculous. About my luggage in Des Moines. Yields down six basis points on a 10-year, 281.97. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Trump insiders told the January 6th committee the former president ignored pleas to call off the mob storming the U.S. Capitol. The panel held a televised primetime hearing Thursday night. Members cast the former president's inaction as a desperate final ploy in his struggle to hold on to the presidency. And the White House is confident that President Biden will avoid the worst of the coronavirus thanks to vaccines and a therapeutic drug. The president is experiencing mild symptoms and has begun taking Pfizer's Paxlovid. He will isolate at the White House whilst continuing his duties.
In New York State, the Republican candidate for governor was attacked at a campaign event. Officials say a man with a pointed weapon tried to drag Congressman Lee Zeldin to the ground before being subdued. No one was hurt. The attack took place outside the city of Rochester. And in Italy, an election will be held September 25th. In the wake of the resignation of Prime Minister Mario Draghi, President Sergio Mattarella dissolved Parliament and officially called for the vote. Following Draghi's move, a centre-right coalition is currently leading in the polls. And Turkey says an agreement to allow shipments of Ukraine's grain will be signed today in Istanbul. Ukraine, Russia and the UN will sign the accord. Ukraine's grain shipments have been largely stalled as its ports have been blocked since the Russian invasion. That led to predictions of an increase in world hunger. Amazon has started delivering packages to U.S. customers using the first of up to 100,000 electric vans it ordered from Rivian. The vehicle rollout began Thursday in seven cities across the U.S. Amazon hopes to have the Rivian vans deployed in more than 100 cities by the end of the year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. doing well, we're getting a lot of work done, going to continue to get it done, and, uh, and in the meantime, thanks for your concern, and keep the faith. The president has COVID, and it's not the news event it would have been two years ago. That is progress, a lot of progress. Futures negative a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by a third of 1%. Yields come in five or six basis points to 281.97. Quite defensive out there in the bond market. The flow is going into treasuries, into buns. Buns aggressively lower. Yields down by 20 basis points or so at the front end. Euro weaker. Euro dollar negative seven tenths of 1% at 101.60. Just the data out of Europe, just not great at all. Downside surprise, downside surprise, downside surprise. And ahead of PMIs a little bit later, Tom, 9.45 Eastern time. Right now we're going to look at this. At the President of the United States, and as John mentions, it is way, way better than what President Trump uh, confronted. Maybe age, maybe health, but also just virulence as well. Lauren Sauer is expert in this field, associate professor at Nebraska, their medical center and director of Special Pathogens Research Network. Uh, Lauren, I want to go to our youth. I remember my mother dragging me in for boosters. It was no big deal. There was whooping cough, tetanus. There was diphtheria, DTAP, and Tdap, and all the rest of it. Why is our fear over a COVID booster shot so different than our fear over getting a diphtheria booster shot? To be honest, Tom, I think a lot of it is politics and the conversation around how the vaccine was developed. I think it's rare that we see the development of a vaccine play out in the public like this one has, where we're seeing every minutia of the stepwise path and where people are paying such close attention to the data that aren't scientists, that aren't clinicians. And they're sending out interpretations into social media or into the news media that might not be quite accurate um, or might be <clears throat> developing. And so I think changing the conversation about how vaccines are made and why we use them is really important. And bringing the trust back to the process, explaining what happened during the COVID vaccine, explaining how these are developed and getting people back on track with some of those vaccines you just mentioned. A lot of kids are have been delayed in getting their childhood vaccines because of the COVID pandemic. So bringing everyone back up to speed and getting that population healthy again. What would you like to see in terms of action from politicians to get us back to where we don't die from diphtheria in one week, like members of my family did in about 1905? I think a huge piece is messaging the process um, and why it's important. So we need to have all of our politicians come out and talk about why vaccines are important for their children. Um, we can't have this vitriol, this dialogue playing out in the public um, sphere and, and recognizing that scientists have a higher level of training. Clinicians have a higher level of training than, you know, the average politician on how vaccines work, why we use them. And so the opinion of an individual in 
you know, let's just say, for example, a member of Congress is different than a physician researcher who's trained for 20 mm -hmm. plus years to develop these vaccines, roll out the trials um, and understand the data on how they work. Well, Lauren, as we talk about the messaging that vaccines work, what a lot of people see is I'm vaccinated and yet I still have a positive case. And especially as we talk about a new variant now that we're being told evades all immunity, whether you've previously had COVID, whether you're vaccinated, does that just raise the question of getting more boosters into arms? Or is that just essentially saying, look, we have to resign ourselves to the fact that everyone will contract the virus. It's just a matter of how bad it is for them. Yeah, I think it's honestly somewhere in between. I think we had a few missteps on the science side of potentially talking about sterilizing immunity early in the pandemic, especially since we didn't know exactly how the um, data would look. And so expecting people to to change their viewpoint from I'm going to get this vaccine and I won't need a vaccine and I won't get sick to um, the vaccine is protecting you, but it's protecting you from getting really sick and possibly ending up in the hospital or dying. And that conversation is continuing to play out. I, I think one eventually once we get that that vaccine level really high in the population, the mild COVID um, will is what we'll start to see. So people will be vaccinated. They'll mm -hmm. probably get on a regular vaccine schedule and it'll feel more like the way we we deal with the flu. And to be honest, people get really sick and they die every year from the flu. Um, but research continues on how to make better flu vaccines, yeah. um, how to make universal flu <laughs> vaccines. And so that we'll probably follow that same path. So what's the appropriate policy response in a world in which people aren't getting as sick, but they still are getting sick? They could still be contagious. Does that mean masks forever? Does that mean we're going to stick with the policy here at Bloomberg where you're out of the office for at least five days if you test positive? I mean, how do things have to evolve in that scenario? Yeah, I think the first step is that we still have to do a lot of work to get our vaccination rate up. So um, reminding people that that they even if they have gotten vaccinated, that they need to get those boosters, uh, pushing the federal government to bring that fourth dose to people, um, continuing to do the studies on how we can get into that vaccine cadence and what's most appropriate. Right. And then I think as we grow that natural immunity in the population or that vaccine immunity, we'll see less right. and less of the masks. But for now, the cases <clears throat> are still quite high. And, and I think right. masking, especially indoors, is quite appropriate. Lauren, are we completely to wear this virus is endemic where it's like it's here get over it it's not moving i think it is here um and i do think it is endemic but we we we're talking about endemic like it's something we just resign ourselves to and accept when in reality we have lots of endemic diseases that we fight tooth and nail to give keep, us an example um, of that. at bay so give dengue is a great example um Loss of fever is a great example. Maybe not in the United States. We don't talk about them in the same way. Um, but but across the world, we fight endemic diseases because they still cause significant morbidity and mortality. And so um, doing all we can to stop COVID spread and to fight COVID to protect our our people is still really important, um, even if the disease becomes or is endemic. Lawrence Sauer, thank you. Wonderful to hear from you, as always. It's been a while, and that's good news, I guess, yeah. but... We've missed you. University of Nebraska Medical Center's Lauren Sauer there. I was just getting lost in a new article out by Mohamed al out on Bloomberg Opinion, and it is punchy. A long list of what the Federal Reserve needs to do next week to avoid being, quote, remembered by economic historians as having un unnecessary caused a U.S. recession, having destabilized the global economy still trying to recover from COVID, having worsened inequality, having fueled unsettling financial stability and having contributed to debt stress in fragile developing countries. Tom, that's the conclusion of Mohammed's piece well, out on Bloomberg Opinion this morning. You know, there's some things I can push against there. It's sort of like the New York Jets. you got to find your evil. But, John, the thing that Dr. Alarian brings up there that I think says August is EM. I'm watching yep. every morning some of the EM unravelings. You never know how they correlate. You never know what the catalyst is going to be. This is away from the ineptitude of Sri Lanka and major cultural issues there. But, John, on the back end of that essay where he mentions EM, I think he's dead on. Special coverage of the Federal Reserve next Wednesday. We'll bring you Bloomberg surveillance the Fed decides. And I'm pleased really? to announce Mohammed will be joining us, Tom. I did not know. Caught up with him yesterday. That has been confirmed. Good. So look out for Mohammed on Wednesday after Do I get to ask him a the question? Fed decision. You can talk if you're polite. Okay, thank you. That's how these things work, Tom.
Futures down two tenths of one percent on the S&P. We're down seven or eight points. Your euro weaker. Euro dollar negative six tenths of one percent and yields in six basis points. Down six basis points to two eighty one forty two <laughs> from New York. This is Bloomberg. would take a lot, I think, for the ECB to, to stop normalizing from where we're at. The ECB has kind of backed into pretty dangerous territory here and, and arguably is on the precipice of a policy mistake. They're hoping they can hike without triggering an even deeper downturn, but that's very much an open question. I think the risk of the markets is that we talk ourselves into a recession. The ECB is an incredibly tough place. All central banks are at the moment. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Hiking into weakness. That's the ECB right now. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Ferro, together with Katie Lines. Bramo back next week. Futures negative, a quarter of 1% on the S&P TK. What a messy time for global markets. Messy time. A lot of news flow coming out here on a Friday. We're we'll slide into the weekend. Uh, we are not. John, you mentioned German yields there as a vote on European confidence. I really wonder how that comes over to what we're going to see next week. Yields down 20 basis points. There and thereabouts <clears throat> earlier this morning, Tom, off the back of data in Germany and across Europe, which is just not great. It's not terrific. In fact, I'd describe it as pretty poor ahead of US PMIs a little bit later. Tom, next week is a massive week for earnings in America. It's not just a Fed <clears throat> decision. We hear from all the big tech heavyweights. Yeah, we do American Express right now. I think those, I don't know Kaylee's looking at those. I think those come in with pretty constructive numbers as well. But you're right. Next week is widely anticipated and... Well, I take issue, John, with the idea of comparing what we see next week with, say, the carnage of snap that we saw yesterday yes, afternoon. Yes, I know. You're not the only one. Kelly Lines is with you. <laughs> A little bit. Looking ahead to Facebook and co next She's week, Kelly. deep into planning crypto Tuesday. Well, that's always true, Tom. I'm always yeah. planning crypto. But I am paying attention to Snap because is that an important <clears throat> macroeconomic indicator as they talk about companies not wanting to spend on online advertising because the environment is deteriorating? And also talking about slowing hiring, something we're hearing more and more companies, especially those in the technology sector, talking about. What does that indicate? Dan Ives of Wedbush called it a paper plane in a windstorm. And we've <laughs> got to see how the likes of Facebook and I Google like stand that. up I've next week. That? I've said that. He's and I said it earlier poetic. as well, Tom. And you seemingly ignored no, it. No, I ignored it. You know, thirty I, minutes I, ago. It okay. <laughs> doesn't count if it comes from you. It doesn't count. You know, that's that's you know. Okay. Ives the poet. It's fantastic. Hopefully we can catch up with them next week. Equities look like this. We're down a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by a half of 1%. Yields in five or six basis points on a 10-year. We've talked a little <clears> bit about what's happening in Europe. Not great things. If you're not paying much attention, that's your summary. Euro dollar negative six tenths of one percent, one oh one sixty six and crude down one and a half percent. Kelly to ninety four ninety one. Yeah, the unwinding of a lot of the price pressure in the commodities complex, definitely something to keep an eye on because in theory that reduces some of that headline inflation pressure that we know the Federal Reserve and other central banks are responding to. Speaking of central bank responses, we got a rate cut from the Bank of Russia about an hour and a half ago or 30 minutes ago. It's Friday. Need to take a break there. But what we actually saw was them cutting rates down to 8%. Economists were expecting them to only cut to 9%. So we saw 150 basis points when we were expecting 50. That brings the cumulative total of rate cuts to 12 percentage points since April. They also said growth isn't going to be down as much this year and inflation isn't going to be up as much. A very different economic outlook than we thought back in February. And we'll be hearing from the Bank of Russia Governor uh, Elvira Nebulina at 8 a.m. New York time. Also at 8 a.m. New York time, we're going to be getting results from Twitter. We were just talking about those advertising headwinds. How much is that weighing on this company? as well. And of course, there won't be a conference call because they're still in the battle with a legal, uh, a legal battle with Elon Musk about that $44 billion takeover. So we'll get the release. We're not going to get much commentary around it. And then finally, at 9.45 a.m. Eastern, we'll get preliminary July PMIs here in the U.S. After those really weak PMIs out of Europe, you two were just talking about. And of course, a little bit weaker economic data over the last two days than economists have been expecting. Will we get a disappointment on these numbers as well, John? Kelly, thank you. Given the execution problems, Tom, at Twitter over the last couple of months. Is that a paper plane with holes in it? 
in a windstorm uh, I, right it, now. I mean, a come complete on. mystery here. I'm Can sure you get a Elon real read Musk off what's happening in. there. No, I don't have a read on that. But what I'm looking at, John, is an absolute confirmation of a travel boom as witnessed through American Express. These are extraordinary okay. numbers with new guidance. Forget about the numbers, John. The real mystery is what does this travel boom do into the end of the year. To me, that's one of the great mysteries into Q3, Q4. They see full year revenue up 23 to 25%. They'd previously seen 18 to 20%. The latest from Amex. We'll get you more on that a little bit later this morning. Here's a quote for you. We are at the crossroads between the end of the commodity run and the beginning of the bond market road to recovery. That quote comes from Emily Rowland and the co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investment Management joins us right now. Emily, what do you mean by the bond market road to recovery? Yeah, clearly, John, we're seeing signs that global economic growth is decelerating at a pretty rapid clip here. Uh, evidence of that over the past few days with economic data uh, in the U.S., initial claims rising. We saw the Philly Fed just plunging. We're seeing the leading economic indicators barely hanging on at 1 percent year over year growth. And now, of course, this PMI data in Europe confirming that Europe is likely in a recession or very close to one. So we see this broad environment where economic growth is slowing. Now, usually in a late cycle period heading into a recession, bond yields fall. But bond yields have been, as we know, seeing this massive backup over the course of 2022. We think now is the time to lean into high quality bonds. One hashtag we've been playing around with is buy bonds and chill. You're getting three to five percent in high quality bonds across munis, mortgage backed securities, treasuries, investment grade mm -hmm. corporates. We would take it right now. Emily, what is the character of this equity bull market of the last six weeks? Yes, we've seen a couple narratives building that are driving this. I think certainly the breather that the dollar is taking. We all know that a stronger dollar can crimp corporate profits. The dollar coming back a little bit. There's also a narrative building that we've reached, you know, maximum capitulation here, meaning that any seller that's gotten that wants to get out has gotten out. And we, we would be really careful with their, that narrative. There's a few kind of things that usually happen when you can call, start to call for a more durable bottom high yield bond spreads. We're at 489 basis points right now. They've got to blow out a lot more earnings estimates. Yes, they're plateauing. Yes, they're leveling off. We want to look for those to actually roll over. And then finally, we have to actually have the recession. You know, there's a <laughs> lot of markets that are pricing in a recession, but we still have unemployment at 3.6 percent. You know, we still have consumer spending pretty elevated here. We have to experience the recession before we can call for a more durable bottom. So we would be careful here about leaning into this rally. OK, Emily, just on the subject of earnings, because obviously it's a big week for those next week. The bulk of the market cap of the S&P 500 will be reporting. Is what you're saying that there is still too much optimism out there on corporate profits? Yeah, when we look at estimates for 2022 earnings growth, they're still at just over 10 percent. And we think that that's likely overly optimistic. We're looking for low single digit growth here. Not terrible. You know, the bar is pretty low. There's a lot of pessimism around earnings. But what companies are doing right now is they're finding every lever they can in order to generate cash flow. So we do see this deceleration in economic growth starting to hurt corporate earnings. Look, the tightening that the Fed has put into the system still needs to be felt uh, by corporations. And, and we still think that there's some room to go there. We do think, though, that leaning into higher quality companies, ones with great cash flow, good return on equity, lots of cash on their balance sheet. That is what you want to do in a late cycle period. And frankly, quality has gotten crushed this year. I don't really understand why we're starting to see a rotation into it. That's where we would lean into for the back half of the year. Emily, one final question from me. Is Europe investable in 2022? Good question. Yeah, I think you've got to be real, real careful there. You know, growth clearly slowing. Earnings estimates are rolling over. We think getting very defensive in Europe, owning quality, embracing areas like utilities, infrastructure, healthcare, staying away. Because from an index construction standpoint, if you own Europe, you own cyclicality, you own economic sensitivity, not what you want to own in a recession. Emily Rowland of John Hancock. Emily, thank you. Tough, tough moment for Europe. We've said that. Put it on repeat. You can clip it, Tom. I'm going to say it a thousand more times through the summer for this ECB yeah. before they meet mm. again in September. Yeah, Nestle in U.S. dollars down 14 percent from the peak, just to give you an idea. I guess it's pretty good. But again, it's, you know, it's a boring food stock. It's not like a tech play, but 
nevertheless, I, I agree on Europe. It's a mystery, but I don't pretend any expertise there, John. You know, I, I think we really need to catch up with David Harrow. Just as one example on your on, on the banks, Tom. Yeah, without a doubt. I think we need to catch up with David, and we can do that. I mean, we were supposed to be in Frankfurt yesterday. If we go for the next meeting, it'd be great to have David Harrow along. You want to do that? You want to go yeah, in I September? Think it'd be good. We could spend the whole of September in Europe, Tom. Given the we Italian could. election is taking place around that time <laughs> too. I, I think we could do month. that. <laughs> We've just put out a survey, Tom, of 44 economists that Bloomberg conducted on where the Fed peak's going to be. Yeah. They've got it at 375 early next you know, year, and then a pause before cutting rates before the end of the year. Uh, do you know how great this is? The interns come in on Friday. I mean, years ago, the interns never showed up on Friday. They should come in on a Friday. Why, why are great. you saying that? Why are you mentioning that? No, I just think it's great that the interns come in on Friday. They're here this early. It's, it's good. They're, they're hungover, but hey, you know. Is there a reason you mentioned that in response to what I just said about Fed funds peaking at <laughs> No, I just, I just, I'm, I'm so, sorry, John, just once me. again, I wasn't paying attention. Okay, thank you. That means a lot, Tom. Let's thank go you. through the price action. Please, let's save to ourselves with the data right. chip. Kelly and I just have a chat. Okay. Futures down by a third of 1%. Oh, let's call it that break. on the S&P. It sounds like you've had a few tanks already. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a half of 1%. Yields in five or six basis points. Kelly, if you wake up this morning and you wanted to be pointed towards one piece of price action, I wouldn't say snap. I'd say look to German bunds. Mm. Look to the German bund market. And what is that telling you right now? It's telling you that the ECB just hiked 50 basis points and got to zero at a time of a very dire economic outlook for Europe. The PMI's contraction territory on the composite in Germany, manufacturing and services are there. And it's not just when it comes to Boone's BTP yields down 19 basis points yes. on the 10 year right now. Down 20 basis points on a two year bund. On a 10 year, we're down 16 or 17. John, it, back to 42 basis points. At John, a Italy, time. Germany. I mean, I'm sorry, it has not come in. It is still severe well it's off the wide to yesterday the let's wise. be clear about that without a doubt and the fact that italian mm. yields are actually coming in today is a positive tom yeah the problem is that the epicenter of all this price action is just really weak european economic data really weak. john the epicenter of italian price action is gucci at the bottom of the spanish stairs you're very distracted right now yeah, aren't i am you? <laughs> I, I he's shopping tell. for That's the epicenter. are you doing online I'm shopping the for for Gucci uh, don't, and dear, for it's not, on, Kaylee, it's not online shopping. Okay. What's the worst macro indicator of what's happening right now? How busy Snapchat the, uh, or Tom spending? No, come <laughs> on. Which, which one? As we discussed yesterday with Francine, the number of chairs empty, empty at the Hassler Bar. That is a major indicator. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rosie Kagupta. U.S. social media giants are on track to lose $69 billion since yesterday's close. Disappointing revenue from the parent of Snapchat raised concerns about the outlook for online advertising for the whole sector. Snap sees a major slowdown in the ad industry and the company is planning what it calls a substantially reduced rate of hiring. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo warns that the U.S. can't keep relying on Taiwan for semiconductors. In a virtual speech to the annual Aspen Security Forum, Raimondo said Congress needs to pass legislation to support the domestic production of high-end computer chips. She called the $50 billion package, quote, a Sputnik moment for America. And there is another sign that a recession may be on the horizon in the euro area. Private sector activity in the region unexpectedly shrank this month for the first time since the pandemic lockdowns of early 2021. A survey of purchasing managers by S&P Global dropped to a 17-month low. Manufacturing output fell and service sector growth almost stalled. In the UK, a new poll shows Foreign Secretary Liz Truss extending her lead over former Chancellor Rishi Sunak in the race to become the next Prime Minister. According to a YouGov survey of Conservative Party members, 62% said they would vote for Truss and 38% went for Sunak. An earlier poll this week had Truss leading by 19 points. And Turkey says an agreement to allow shipments of Ukraine's grain will be signed today in Istanbul. Ukraine, Russia and the UN will sign the accord. Ukraine's grain shipments have been largely stalled as its ports have been blocked since the Russian invasion. That's led to predictions of an increase in world hunger. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think that it's important for us to show support uh, for Taiwan. I also think that we have, none of us has ever said we're for independence when it comes to Taiwan. That's up to Taiwan to decide. 
That was Nancy Pelosi, the U.S. Speaker of the House there. From New York City this morning, good morning. Futures are negative, a third of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're down by a half of 1%. This from Mohammed Alarian this morning on the Fed. It seems to remain the central bank in advanced econ economies that is most prone to, using a phrase from the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, fairy tale economics. And it is the most systemically important of all these central banks. Mohammed fiery this morning, Tom, going into the Fed next week. Yeah, it's an important essay, and it's something we'll uh, play off of here, not only today, but through the weekend and into next week as well. I think, my, uh, uh, John, we really have to set up uh, the Fed meeting next week. It, it, I, I have to admit it's a different meeting now after the desperation we saw from the ECB yesterday. 75 basis points seems to be the story, yeah, Tom, yeah, but you know what? Maybe we wake that. up on Monday to another article that tells us it's 50 or a hundred. I've got no idea. Uh, that's a parlor I'm game. Not I'm not bitter about it at all, messaging. am I? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking at German yield right now. Hey, Tom, Unreal. finally, thank you. And you're, you're getting on board this morning. Well, no, I, you know, I don't you, want to go that He executed his online shopping took purchase. Him, and... Kelly, it took an hour and 20 minutes for Tom to log into the terminal and have a look at where buns were. <laughs> yeah, but the I've, problem I've with that, John, five is it, times this John, morning. I didn't darken the door till 5.54, so that was the real problem there. Uh, this is a personal note, and it has to do with the courage of Lee Zeldin, who is a Republican candidate for governor of New York, where he was accosted yesterday in New York, in Western New York, I have a major, major acquaintance with. We used to measure the size of a Jenny Cream Ale by the size of the beverage at whichever bar we were showing our legal driver's license to. And the best pace in Fairport, New York, was the VFW. And we would literally say, let's go have a VFW, and fancy brats like me would hang out with the middle class of Fairport, New York, this along the Erie Canal. Joe Matthew joins us now on the summer of discontent for our middle class. Joe, I don't even know the details of the attack on uh, the candidate for Republican governor in New York. Yep. He is safe. That is fine. But what we do have is a summer of middle class discontent. How does Washington play that? Well, I'll tell you, Adam Kinzinger, I guess, was correct when he said that there is more violence coming. This is a terrifying moment here, and I'm glad you brought it up, Tom. It's not getting enough attention. This guy tried to stab uh, Mr. Zeldin on stage, and uh, Zeldin took care of himself. He managed to grab the guy's wrist before people could actually uh, jump on him, and he is all right. But is this the new world that we're living in here? When, my goodness, after what we saw with uh, Shinzo Abe following January 6th, right. this, is, this is not a business for the faint of heart. And based on what we're seeing here in the January 6th committee, uh, there are a lot of things that you right. might not want to know that happened that day. Joe, partition how the Democrats and the Republicans each have a different middle class. What is that distinction between Speaker Pelosi's middle class and President, former President Trump's middle class? Well, it's interesting. Uh, it's a great question. It drives the conversation in two different ways. Uh, the Democratic middle class, at least through the eyes of Speaker Pelosi, and by the way, Joe Biden, who talks about, you know, when he was growing up and his dad was said the middle class just needs a little bit of breathing room. We hear that refrain a lot. They think that the progressive Build Back Better agenda is, in fact, what's needed here. Child tax credits and so forth that, that they're not getting lower prescription drug prices. The, the Republican middle class says no. Uh, in many cases, let's bring back Donald Trump and get back to growth here, get back to tax cuts. And that's going to be the conversation that people will need to use to decide uh, when they go to the polls in November. Well, speaking of conversations that have lasted a very long time, Joe, Build Back Better is something we've been talking about for how long? Where as are, long as is we've known even, each other, Kaylee. Does, does it even <laughs> exist anymore? I mean, it just seems like little fragments of what the initial legislation was intended to be. Well, that's true. It's going to be a shadow of, uh, well, I won't say its former self because it never really existed. Uh, the, the massive uh, $2 trillion plan that, that never got through Congress late last year is, is going to be much smaller. And, and based on what we're hearing from Joe Manchin, uh, will be, we'll be very deliberate. The prescription drug component will be in there. And also, I've said this before, keep an eye out. No one is talking about it for expanded subsidies, enhanced subsidies for Obamacare that were put in place during COVID. They expire 
at the end of the year. Until now, there's been no plan for Democrats to extend them, and they want to use that reconciliation bill, call it Build Back Better Light or whatever you want, as an opportunity to put that in there. Now that we have a president with COVID, by the way, there's still the matter of COVID funding as well. Ten to twenty billion dollars requested over six months ago still has not seen the light of day. We were told by the White House therapeutics would start running out by now, yeah. and by September, vaccines will start running out if this isn't handled. Well, to that point, Joe, Biden campaigned in part on getting the pandemic under control, That's even right. if it isn't as severe, which is evidenced by the fact that we are treating President Biden's COVID case very differently than we treated President Trump's in October 2020. Is the White House kind of putting that on the back burner? I mean, it doesn't seem like there's any effort toward getting people vaccinated and boosted. The conversation about it largely seems to have just faded into the background. Well, they did take the opportunity yesterday to say, look, the president is not in the hospital because he's fully vaccinated. They did urge people, particularly those over 50, if you don't have the vaccine, go out and get it now. It is extremely important. But the, the why is what's changing. One year ago in a CNN town hall, President Biden said these vaccines will keep you from getting COVID. Yesterday, it was clear that that was no longer the case. And in fact, people who get vaccines could still be infected. And they said everyone at some point will. It's just that your symptoms will be lower. That's going to be the message from the White House here going forward. It's a lot different than where we were a year ago. Hey, Joe, good to catch up as always, sir. Joe Matthew there down in D.C. We've <coughs> got to get back to this bond market in Germany. We're down 24 basis points on a two-year yield. The attention's here because of what's happened with the economic data out of Germany and the energy issue as well. When the PMIs come out, the dividing line between contraction and expansion, it's 50. We've got sub-50 out of Germany today. The composite at 48. It's on a 48 handle well, on the PMI. I, I agree in the, in the movement here on a two-year yield from a 0 0.77 to a 0 0.43. The word is precipitous. John, I keep saying this, and I felt it yesterday with the, the lengthy uh, ECB conference that we took, and that is there's a war going on. And I think we're all struggling with the fact we're distant from the war. I, I, there's, we're on war footing in Europe, yep. and we shouldn't be surprised by these economic shocks. And for that reason, Tom, a lot of this is unforecastable. On top of that, of how do you price is. in a rate hiking cycle with that in mind? You don't. So the euro's weaker and the two-year yield is much lower <clears throat> off the back of this. I mean, we're looking at the biggest one-day drop on a two-year. The headline crossed earlier since 2008. It's yeah, a well, big, big move, Tom. And, and what if we break through to these new levels and negative rates, whatever? What does Euro do? And you had the Kit Jukes thing. You were putting something out on Twitter, John, when I was just getting into unbuyable, the office. Unbuyable, unbuyable, his words, yeah, Tom. Yeah, yeah. That's a Coming up, Terry Wiseman's going to join us from Macquarie <clears> on this mess in Europe. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Three-day winning streak on the S&P 500 into Friday. This Friday morning, we're negative a quarter of 1% on the S&P. We came very close to 4K at the close just yesterday on the S&P 500. We're pulling back just a touch, down four-tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq. Snap numbers, awful. Kaylee's going to go through them for you. Oh, In about really? 30 minutes, we get Twitter, Tom. So I know you're super excited to hear I'm from Twitter. I'm way on top of Twitter. As well. I'll get to the bond Maybe market Maybe they sold briefly. some Bitcoin. I'll go to Treasuries, <laughs> twos, tens and thirties. You want to talk about Tesla too? Your two-year comes in seven or eight basis points. Your 10-year down seven basis points. This is really defensive stuff, and arguably not just off the back of the recent economic data out of America, but also off the back of the economic data in Europe too this morning. Take a look at Germany. Your two-year yield is down 25 basis points on a two-year yield. Think about that. The why? The data in Europe is just bad. Sub-50 on a PMI, Tom. That's contraction territory. That's why you're seeing German yields plummet while you're seeing a euro weaker again and getting back to 101. They don't have an NBER. I wonder how they figure out recession over there. I honestly don't know the answer to that, John. The market will do the maths for them, yeah, Tom. Exactly. The numbers don't look good. Yeah. And we've got to figure out the incoming data and I what it means for upcoming policy meetings. I know you it. want to go to the next yeah. Frankfurt meeting in Germany, Tom. I think we also I, I, need I to think work out we need the to go number to the one Bank issue. Of France meeting. Tom, the number one issue is the gas flowing from Russia into Europe. Yes. And right now you can't forecast that. But what I need to understand, and I think what we all need to understand, Tom, is how the ECB will react to that if we do get a negative supply shock on energy in Europe this year. How do they react to higher energy prices if they're worried about second round effects? Do they just keep hiking into economic weakness, Tom? Or is there a tipping point 
later this year. They are a central bank that will adapt to a war footing. That's what they're talking about now. Ambrose Evans Pritchard in The Telegraph talked about how the United Kingdom has to figure out a war footing like Europe. They're all trying to do it. I mean, I mean, there's a war going on. The epsilon in the yes. equation goes to the moon. Tom, we're on the same page. We are? We are. Of course, there is a war Kaylee. going on. That's undeniable. Wow. We're on the same page. Tom, what I keep stating, though, is what we've got to figure out is what happens if if that guest gets shut off, how does the ECB respond to that? We need to work that out, Tom. We need to establish the reaction function of a given central bank to work out what the data means. You can't just say you're data dependent, we go meeting by meeting, and then the market tries to figure it out and can't because the ECB gets to pick and choose every other meeting, Tom, and then comes out a few days before with a newspaper article and says, we'll go 50. That's not how this is meant to work. It's not how it's meant to work at all. You're Euro right now. Weaker by seven tenths of one percent. That's across asset price action. Let's get you some single names. A little bit of snap, some Twitter. Tom can't wait. It's Kelly Lines. Yeah, a lot of snap, or at least a lot of downside for snap. Remember, this is a stock that was down 70% ahead of its earnings results, and after the fact, it's down another 30% in pre-market trading. Absolutely brutal as the revenue disappoints due to a slowdown in online advertising spending because of the deteriorating macroeconomic environment. And of course, in theory, that has a read through to other companies dependent on that online ad revenue. The likes of Pinterest down 6%. Meta is lower. Alphabet is lower. Of course, both of those companies reporting next week and reporting later on this morning in less than half an hour. Twitter, it also is down 2.5%. How much do we see similar advertising trends affecting them? But of course, there's a lot of noise with that one because of Elon Musk's takeover, maybe not, of that company. There are some other earnings movers related as well that are seeing pretty big declines. Intuitive Surgical missing on the top and bottom line. Actually, the biggest revenue miss on a percentage basis going all the way back to 2013, it's down 12%, as is Seagate, the big uh, computer company. It's down about 12% uh, after his forecast, disappointed, citing a weaker environment, uh, economic outlook. One positive story out there, though, and this is interesting because we're talking about weak economics on one side, American Express raising its full-year revenue growth outlook to up to 25%. It previously thought it would only get up 20%. And when you look at the numbers in the quarter just reported, record spending on the part of American Express customers. Volumes up 30%. Now, of course, part of that is because prices are just higher. People are still spending. Of course, they're using leverage to do so. But a very interesting conversation to have as American Express rises about 4% in pre-market trading time. Thank you, Kaylee Lines. Greatly appreciate that. Right now, this is a joy, incredibly well timed. Thierry Weisman joins us, global interest rates and currency strategist at Macquarie. Thierry, I know John really wants to focus on Europe, and yes, that is front and center now. But I've got to go back to what you and I did years ago, which is the unraveling of currencies that we see in EMFX, particularly the Pacific Rim, Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, 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 Malaysia, and, and, and the rest of them. Are we hearkening back to another August of long ago? Look, I, it, uh, the, the emerging markets are not really, uh, a, you know, a, a blob, uh, Tom. It's not as if uh, Brazil does, has the same dynamics, let's say, as in Indonesia, as in China. Uh, there's a lot of uh, variation in the emerging markets, especially with regard to what they depend on for their terms of trade, where they get funding from. I, I hate to uh, overly generalize about them. I could tell you, however, that, you know, with commodity prices now sliding, which is a very different situation that we had in the first quarter of this year when they were generally rising on the back of the, the premise that the war would, would drive commodity prices up or that a recovery would drive commodity prices up. I am concerned about those emerging markets that are overly dependent on commodity prices mm -hmm. to support their terms of trade. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil, for example, Colombia, Chile to some extent, and some of the Southeast Asian markets that you mentioned, South Africa as well. But if we're talking about those uh, emerging markets that are not overly dependent on commodities, China, for example, uh, then I'm not too concerned. Um, th th we have to make a distinction between, right. at this point, between those emerging markets that are commodity dependent and those that are not. Thierry, let's swing over to Germany. John has been focused here on the collapse that we see in yields today in Germany, economic contraction amid a war. How do you synthesize the uncertainty of a war in Ukraine across the economics and the finance of Europe? I think the gravest concern right now, Tom, is the one uh, you guys were talking about earlier, which is the prospect that we will see rationing in electricity uh, in Europe if we do not get the natural gas flows restarted. 
Uh, there's another problem in Europe, of course, which is climate resiliency, which is also uh, eating into their, uh, their reserves of natural gas. We may be facing a situation where in the winter we just don't have enough natural gas, but politicians and policymakers will anticipate that and ration well ahead. In fact, that could start any time. I think to the extent that the weakness in the P PMIs was so significant in July, it's because these companies are concerned that they will not have the electricity to produce. And if they don't, what's the point of ordering machinery if you're not gonna be able to run them uh, in the next few months? That's the gravest concern. With regard to how the ECB handles that, it's anyone's guess, but I also agree with you that they were too ambiguous uh, in the communications yesterday with respect to what kind of data they're gonna be watching. And I think the weakness that we're seeing in the Euro this morning has to do a lot with the fact that there's ambiguity with respect to what the ECB is watching. We are clueless as to what their reaction function is. That's absolutely so, right. That's the problem. And with that in mind, it gets very, very difficult to buy the Euro. That's their problem too, because that means weaker inflation. Sockgen's kit juice came out this morning and said it was still unbuyable, potentially through the rest of this year. Terry, do you share that view? I, I do. I, I mean, if we're looking for those triggers that are going to cause, that are going to create escape velocity for the euro, we just don't see where they are short of a diplomatic solution to the war, because the war has so much to do with European growth right now. Uh, especially through the prospect of electricity rationing and the implications it's going to have on industry. Look, if they ration, they're going to ration industry. They're not going to ration households. That would be a political disaster. Uh, they'll shut down factories. They'll have them running four days a week instead of five. That's the scenario that will, will hang over this market until we get clarity and resolution on the natural gas flows. And that's presumably dependent on a, a resolution to this war. Terry, I tried very hard to listen to every word that Christine Lagarde said in the press conference yesterday, and there were just very few things that I felt were worth transcribing quotes from her, one of them being, we are moving in one go to zero. Does that mean we are changing the terminal rate at which we want to arrive? No. Then a couple of seconds later, she goes on to say, what is the neutral setting? At this point in time, I don't know. Terry, do you know, do we have a real understanding of how high the ECB is actually going to be able to hike rates, given everything you've just laid out for us? Our own economists think that we could get a terminal rate that's above one sometime in the early part of next year. We're starting to have our doubts, though, right? Uh, the, the, the reason has to do, again, with the prospect that if we get an electricity rationing in Europe, we're going to see much lower growth in the second half of this year. It's effectively the road to ruin. On top of that, of course, you have uh, stress on, on the Italian BTP market coming from uh, too many speculators who think that they should make a run, a speculative attack on, on Italian bonds. Those two things, I think, have the capacity to deter the ECB from going all the way up to one and a quarter, let's say, by the beginning of next year. I think that what uh, Christine Lagarde was trying to say when she invoked the idea that they're data dependent and month to month is exactly that, that they just do not know how they're going to respond to a situation where inflation continues to go up, but you have financial stresses in the credit markets at the same time that you have a collapse in sentiment and the outlook for new orders continues to deteriorate. And Terry, you nailed it. They're data dependent, except they don't know how they're going to respond to the data. That's right. <laughs> Terry Wiseman of Macquarie, thank you. And Tom, that's the difficulty we've all got with this ECB right now. Yeah, you know, there's no question about it. I mean, and, and the, the ambiguity is the word there. I think ambiguity, and, and not only the English part of it, but the economic part of the use of the word ambiguity really plays it out, sure. John. And, and, and again, the German yield is a precursor for just a simple observation. When and how does euro break 1.0167 and revisit below parity? It's just odd to see these kind of moves on a 24 hours after the Hawks took control of the ECB where it seems like they basically turned around and said you can have your TPI tool dripping in mystery and ambiguity. And they get 50 beeps. And we'll have 50 basis points, yeah. and let's try and do that again but in September. The markets go right again to September and model that out. I can't emphasize enough, John, how the look back that we do is just wrong. They're always sure. driving forward. Tom, I, I can't emphasize enough that some of this weakness you see in the euro it's not just about the economic data. It's also because there is such a lack of understanding about how this ECB is going to respond to that data. Biggest risk factor this year for Europe is that the gas gets turned off <clears throat> from Russia into Europe, and we don't know how they'll respond to right. it. That's tough. The euro's weaker, yields are lowered by eight basis points on a 10-year in Germany, much more so. Futures are down by just two-tenths of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. 
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Trump insiders told the January 6th committee the former president ignored pleas to call off the mob storming the U.S. Capitol. The panel held a televised primetime hearing Thursday night. Members cast the former president's inaction as a desperate final ploy in his struggle to hold on to the presidency. And the White House is confident that President Biden will avoid the worst of the coronavirus thanks to vaccines and a therapeutic drug. The president is experiencing mild symptoms and has begun taking Pfizer's Paxlovid. He will isolate at the White House whilst continuing his duties. Authorities and lawmakers in Taiwan are said to be hurt and confused by developments in Washington over a possible visit by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who would be the first by a House Speaker to Taiwan since 1997. President Biden says the U.S. military doesn't think it's a good idea. China has warned Pelosi against going to Taiwan, which Beijing claims as part of its territory. And in New York State, the Republican candidate for governor was attacked at a campaign event. Officials say a man with a pointed weapon tried to drag Congressman Lee Zeldin to the ground before being subdued. No one was hurt. The attack took place outside the city of Rochester. And American Express posted second quarter revenue that soared 31% to a record. That led the company to raise its forecast for full year revenue. Amex customers kept spending on travel despite mass cancellations and long waits at the airports. Meanwhile, the company's expenses rose in more than expected 32%. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Richard Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Currently, there is at least a trickle of uh, gas supply uh, going through Nord Stream 1, but we never know whether or not this is going to be uh, 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 this is going to continue for several months. In Europe, basically, the border between stagnation and a proper uh, significant recession is whether or not we still have access to uh, uh, Russian gas. It is one of the biggest risk factors into the second half for the European economy. That was Jill Moak there, the chief economist at AXA Investment Management from New York this morning. Good morning. Here's your equity market. We're down a tenth of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, down by about a third of 1%. Yields in by eight basis points now. It's a break of 280 on a 10-year in America, 279.77. And it's a big break lower in German yields off the back of what's happening, Tom, with that economic data. <clears throat> and as Jill Moak said, Nord Stream 1 is back online running at 40% well, capacity, relatively speaking, compared to the news of this week. That's better than expected. But the risk factor is this could come down to 20%, Tom, in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, yen with a big move against euro. I'm going to say euro hasn't broken yet. I'd watch that, John, in the next coming hours. Yeah, down 6 tenths to 1%, 10169 Right now on oil, Julian Lee joins us. And, of course, this has to do with Germany as well, oil strategist at Bloomberg. Uh, John Farrell, Julian Lee, particularly is focused on this. As you read into the weekend, what is the distinction in the Nord Stream debate, in the turbine debate, in the pushing of hydrocarbons all across great distances debate, what's the distinction you're studying? I, I think the, you know, the thing that I'm looking at at the moment is uh, sort of the, the levers of uncertainty that, that uh, President Putin uh, is wielding, um, and that is um, on again, off again, uh, gas supplies through Nord Stream. Uh, will they keep up at this, this current level of 40%? Will they go down again? Um, will he uh, start messing around with, with crude oil exports? We're certainly seeing you know, crude uh, being shipped much longer distances than it was in the past. Um, but we are seeing, you know, while we're seeing Russian flows going to, to Asia, we are seeing compensating flows coming uh, in the opposite direction as well. Um, and I think the, the, the big thing in, in, with oil at the moment, at least, is uh, weighing up uh, the demand side uncertainties. Uh, COVID um, coming back again in, in China, uh, uncertainty over European economic growth um, against the supply uncertainties around uh, Russia. And uh, will the, the OPEC plus countries agree to uh, further output increases they meet at the beginning of August. Um, eyes are going to start focusing on that perhaps next week. Julian, just as far as the European gas consumption 
is concerned. What's the latest on the voluntary demand cuts that were floated early this week? Well, I mean, they're, they're, st they're still out there. Um, there's clearly a need for this. I mean, whatever happens with, with Russian gas flows, um, Europe is going to have to get its, its gas consumption down, and I think that's going to be the UK as much as continental Europe. And the sooner we start doing that collectively, uh, the, the uh, less severe the cuts are going to have to be. If, if uh, you know, we, we keep burning gas at the current rate right up until the start of winter, then I think things are going to get uh, very tricky as, as the temperatures get, get colder. So the sooner we start um, curtailing gas consumption, the less uh, deep we're going to have to make those cuts. Off the subject of gas, onto the subject of oil, Julian, I'm just taking a look at WTI prices down some 18% since their peak just last month. I mean, we have seen a massive cooling in the oil market. Obviously, a lot of the conversation shifting to a potential cooling in demand if the economy is slowing. Yeah. And yet, I know that earlier this week, you put out an opinion piece that says, if we're lucky, OPEC is wrong about its demand forecast because we're still not going to have enough supply to meet it. Is the market getting the supply and demand balance wrong? I think there's, there's a number of things that, that um, either the, the market isn't fully um, getting right or perhaps the forecasters aren't getting right. I mean, if you uh, look at the OPEC forecast, which is what I was talking about in my column, uh, they're talking about 2.7 million barrels a day of demand growth next year um, and an incremental requirement for uh, crude from OPEC of about 1.4 million barrels a day from where they are now. Uh, that's going to be very difficult for them to do, I think, given, uh, given capacity limitations. But the other big concern, I think this is a concern that the, the U.S. Treasury mm -hmm. has, is that the market isn't fully pricing in uh, the potential impact of EU sanctions on Russian oil and, in particular, uh, the, the upcoming ban on insurance uh, on right. tankers carrying that crude which they say could push prices up significantly. Julia, no one's watching in America on a Friday morning, so let's go buy, hold, sell. What's your view on oil out six months or a year? We've got one group up, up, and away. we got another group going, uh, maybe not. What is it? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to try and call it even a month ahead, uh, let alone six. My, <laughs> my feeling is that, that if you buy into the up, 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 uh, mm -hmm. narrative, um, you're very quickly going to find yourself on the down, down, down uh, narrative because um, as oil prices rise, I think that is going to uh, put much more pressure on the economy um, as it has every other time that we've seen oil, right. um, you know, getting up above $120 a barrel. So I think if oil does go up, 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 it's probably not sustainable. Julian, awesome to hear from you. Julian Lee there Thank out you, of Julian. London on the energy situation. Just one more thing on London for a lot of people who might be interested in this. British Airways have just avoided another strike, Tom, potentially taking place. I... They've avoided that and they've come to a deal with that one union. Well, what do you think? You're more up to speed. Do you want the new pay deal, Tom? Together? They're getting an 8% pay rise, a one-off bonus and a reinstatement of shift pay. And it was backed by 75% of workers. That according to Sky News yeah, yeah. moments ago. I, well, the thing I don't understand, if the planes are jammed and they're getting what they're getting, they're getting revenues, right? Yes. So... Can the airport service what the airline wants to do, though? Seems to be the yeah, tricky part. Yeah, that seems Tom. to be the point. John, what I've learned, I learn something new every day, folks. And I really have to say, given this week of tumult, our team has been outstanding. The bookings have been better than good and just some really, really good work. John, on the break... I had no idea Boston Beer was a future Dow component uh, because of this thing called seltzer and hard seltzer. Hard John, seltzer have you ever had one? That, sure. What's it called? Katie Whiteclaw. Theirs isn't White Claw. Theirs is truly, which no, in my sure, personal opinion is... No, sure, but hard seltzer is White Claw, yeah? White Claw is hard seltzer. It's I, same not category. A not a fan. It's fizzled. Cowan said it's, that I, the I, hard seltzer category is still murky, Tom. That's, that's the latest on that front. The stock's down 9%. Well, the stock's down 74% from the peak boom. I mean, Kaylee, did you see hard seltzer as a peak boom in the summer of last year? When all of a sudden there's like 80 different hard seltzer brands in the cooler at Whole Foods, I think it kind of tells you that, uh, you know, maybe... It's the, the summer of 2019, Tom. What that's is, when it really exploded it, yeah. in a massive way and everyone it, seemed to have a... Hard sounds they, around. They, they named one after Gary Cooper. There's High Noon or something, which is, you yes, know. Yes, which like, you have to buy at the liquor store. Because it has vodka, vodka. If I, I don't get the rules around where you can buy and can't buy alcohol.
in this country. It's what clearly is, Friday. What is the hard the part grain. of the one you can buy at the grocery store? If it's not vodka, what is it? I think it's a lower alcohol content. Tom. Yeah, it's like malt or something. It, this has helped know. everybody out, hasn't it? <laughs> it's a great segment. Cut this out. The, the investment of our Twitter. team in this was, right was stunning. Put Super this one out on Twitter. Yeah, sure. Twitter earnings are coming up. Tom's excited for that. Futures are down a tenth of 1%. <laughs> We recover just a little bit. We're seeing a bit more weakness now, cracks in consumers, in the housing market. That's the inflation picture in Europe and globally. It just forces central banks to front load. The natural slope, I think, for the ECB is to really get at least into this neutral range. It's tricky for Europe because the ECB is potentially raising rates into a period where we're already seeing slowing growth. It's always a trial and error situation, and I think personally they made the error. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keene. Thrilled you're with us on a Friday, looking into weekend reading, looking into a critical week next week. And, John, for Jerome Powell, and certainly for Germany, it's Fragmentation Friday. I'd go further, Tom. It's on the brink of recession Friday over in Europe, looking at those PMIs. Dreadful. And looking at that move at the front end of the German Bund curve, Tom. Amazing. Down 25 basis points on a two-year. That's a big move. The global price comes in. Copper doesn't come in, John. I'm looking at Chicago. Maybe LME Copper tells me something different. But oil giving that economic slowdown indicator. Our next stop, Tom, PMIs out of America, 945 <clears throat> Eastern time. And the data over the last 24 hours hasn't been terrific. Look at the move on Treasuries now, down eight basis points on a 10-year, 279 on a 10-year yield. Well, that's 279 and a 10 year uh, yield. But again, we saw massive curve inversion this morning out to a negative uh, 225 basis points. Uh, Priya Misra, I know, I believe, scheduled to be with us on our Fed meeting uh, here coming up on Thursday. But, John, to me, the yield dynamics in America seem so separate after what we witnessed yesterday. All of us picking up the debris of what we saw at 830 yesterday. I think we're all confused by that news conference once it wrapped <laughs> yeah. up at 945. Tom, just getting some numbers from Twitter. Twitter. They come in at 1 billion, the adjusted revenue at 1.08 billion, the estimate by 1.23 billion. So that's a downside surprise there. The average monetizable daily average user. Did I do that right? You Jeez. nailed it, John. Jeez, <laughs> they've got to fix it. Have this. another hard seltzer. 237.8 million, the estimate 237.5 million. million. Tom, the stock is down by 3% after the mess of Snapchat yesterday afternoon. Yeah, you know, and, and, and again, it's a revenue, you know, we say trails estimate is the way we 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 estimate this. But again, I, th I think we misunderstand, John, how small these social media efforts are compared to real tech, as, as Kaylee mentioned earlier, Facebook. A sure, Tom, I go further, and Kaylee's going to weigh in this, on this in a minute. They've got a massive <clears> execution <throat> problem this quarter <laughs> over at Twitter. I know everyone's looking for a macro signal. I'm not saying you won't get it from the social media companies. I'm just saying maybe look to Alphabet and Facebook next week and not to a company like yeah. Twitter, who yeah. we don't know who's going to run the company well, in the next several months, and no one at that company knows either. Right. Kaylee, you helped us with hard seltzer. Help us with Snap and Twitter now. You're more attached to it. Well, as John said, it's both a macroeconomic outlook and then also just the fact that they are in the middle of a huge legal battle with the richest man in the world. And they speak to that in the statement. They talk about how revenue came in light. They say that reflects advertising industry headwinds associated with the macroeconomic environment, as well as uncertainty related to the pending acquisition of Twitter by an affiliate of Elon Musk. So... It's both and. But to John's point, when we get Meta, when we get Alphabet, some of the big tech giants out there next week, are they going to fall victim to the same slowdown in ad spending as companies look around at what the economy is doing and say, mm, yeah, maybe I, not I, so much? It's a mystery. I guess it's, John, what's the biggest mystery on the screen as you go to the real yield this afternoon? It's not a mystery for me. It's pretty obvious. But that's what we've got to look at. It's the drop off in yields, Tom, particularly in Germany this morning after the ECB made a move to hike interest rates by 50 basis points and seemingly teed up another one in September. The data is speaking loudly, yeah. clearly in Europe, that things aren't good. 8% off good. the equity bottom, John, 32 on the VIX down to 23. It's not the glory of 10 full VIX points, but I'll take nine. Futures right now down two tenths of 1%, Tom, on the <clears> S&P on the NASDAQ. We're down by about a third of 1%. I'll wrap things up for you. Crude down by more than one full percentage point. Just about hanging on to 95. Euro dollar 101.70. We've talked about that euro weakness. There it is for you. And in the bond market, down by seven basis points. 
and just, just Tom at 280.50 on a US 10 year. Very good. With us now, Liz Young, head of investment strategy at SoFi, always with a different and twisted view. And for you, Liz Young, it's the things to watch in August that are different and twisted. Which indicator, which ratio matters to you as a crystal ball for August? Well, first and foremost, next week matters to me a lot because we're going to get not only economic data, we're going to hear from the Fed again. And right now, the expectation is that this is maybe the last really big hike that we get before they 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 could slow down at least the size of hikes in September. Also, next week, we're getting more than 30 percent of S&P components reporting earnings, and that's going to be across sectors. Now, earnings season has been mixed, not terrible so far, but we have heard from a lot of companies that they're thinking the following environment is going to be more challenging. So they're preparing themselves for that challenge. I think next week, when we really hear the rubber hit the road on how this has affected companies in the consumer space, in the materials space, industrials, that's where you feel that squeeze of inflation. Liz, with that in mind, how much confidence do you have in the bounce that we've seen in the stock market? Uh, I don't have a ton of confidence that it's durable yet. I think it's dangerous to declare victory before we've seen any moderation in inflation. And the other thing I would say about that is I think what the Federal Reserve wants to see is that there's a trend down in inflation. And a trend, as we know, is not just one data point. So even if inflation starts to moderate with the July data, that doesn't mean that it's over. We need to see that happen for, in my opinion, three consecutive months before the Fed is going to say, OK, you know what? It's working. We can take our foot off the gas pedal of this tightening. OK, Liz, so you say it's dangerous or at least too early to call the bottom in the equity market. Was it too early to call the death of the 60-40 portfolio again, as we've done so many times? Because I'm looking at a pretty healthy bond rally right now. Yeah, yeah, look, I think it was probably OK to start thinking about 6040 presenting an opportunity again. Now, it wasn't wrong to say that 6040 didn't work for a long time. That was very much true. And while we had low rates and bond yields were as low as they were, they weren't providing that diversification benefit. But now, to your point, there is more of an opportunity in bonds. But here's where I would be really, really careful. You can't just paint with a broad brush in bonds. You can't say, OK, corporate bonds, there's a huge opportunity, too. Because really, if we're worried about a recessionary situation and we're worried about more stress in the equity market, that also means more stress in corporate bonds, both investment grade and high yield. Those spreads have gotten a little bit worse, but they haven't gotten as as bad as you would expect them to be mm -hmm. in a recessionary environment. So you okay. have to be looking at treasuries and those really high quality bonds. Well, what would you be looking for on high yield spreads then? We've heard this week 700 plus. Well, yes, and spreads have doubled since the beginning of the year. But think about where they've gotten to in other recessionary environments. You, you hear them above 10 percent, right? They may not get to that level, but they could widen out from here. So I would just be careful in that space, because what you see usually is the equity market is going to correct, right? But then there's this big correlation between equities and high yield bonds. The other thing is you're already hearing from companies that have credit card businesses that they're preparing for loan losses, they're preparing for consumers to not be necessarily spending as much and maybe for that payment cycle to slow down. So you have to think about that as well as a debt uh, market indicator. Liz, got to squeeze this in. One of the big winners this year, the energy sector in the stock market. It's rolled over a lot since June. Liz, it was the beneficiary of the big inflation trade this year. I just wonder, Liz, how it performs as growth continues to decelerate in the back half of this year. What are you looking for there? So I think you have to separate what energy is trading at versus what energy stocks might trade at. And if you are an income investor, and you are a cyclical investor and you need to balance your portfolio, energy stocks might offer an OK opportunity and they are paying a nice dividend. So it's not that you need to get out of energy stocks. But if you take the other side of that and look at the commodity itself, because we're seeing a slowdown in demand, because we're all hoping for a slowdown in inflation and we have central banks trying to fight that demand story, I don't think that energy as a commodity is going to see a ton more upside. It could stay elevated compared to where it was before, but I don't think that there's a ton more juice that we're going to squeeze out of it as an energy trade commodity-wise. Liz, awesome to catch up. Looking ahead to next week. Liz Young there 
of SoFi with equity futures down by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P on crude time we're down by 1.3% to $95 <sighs> and well, almost a, breaking down to yeah, 94 there's a way but I really want to say equity's resilient here and I don't know which way it cuts it I mean snap gets all the headlines but what I saw yesterday for example from the health company Danaher what you see from American Express today shows me and Julian Emanuel summarizes Equities are resilient within all the economic gloom. Twitter resilient, Tom. There's one for you. Put that in a headline. Stocks only down 2%. Katie, off the back of this mess. Only as they cite the same ad advertising headwinds that, headwinds that we heard Snap talking about. Snap's punishment far worse. That stock's down yeah. the better part of 30% in pre-market trading. Also down in tandem with both of those, Alphabet. And Meta, Alphabet right now off about 3%, Meta yeah. more than 4%. We get those reports next week, Tom. John, you know, I'm really focused here on what you and I need to do to finish the month strong. Here we go. And what is value it? value to Bloomberg surveillance. And I've never seen a friendly. I mean, okay. What game do you want to go and see? I would say Tots Roma. Where's that taking place? I don't know that. I want you to. I can't okay, figure well, out I don't if know. it's. You're the one who knows this stuff now. No, I can't. I, I, they flip them in Europe, folks. Like, I think it's in Rome. Because that's the way baseball is here. Oh, usually but the first team is I the home team, Tom. But okay. typically in a friendly preseason, that could be anywhere in the world. Ex oh, I've got, it could. I've got no idea. It okay. might not be in North London. Well, we need to do further research on this, John. I think it does. It's a value add that we can add to Bloomberg. Someone's going to message me immediately to tell me where that is, Tom. So when I find out, it's I'll, a friendly. I'll let everyone know. It's a friendly. Are friendlies Just like friendly? They can be, Tom. People are usually less aggressive. Do the, do the stars play? Does Harry play? Some of them do when you try and get the rest of the squad on too so they get fit for the season that starts in early August. That's what you and I do. This is us right now, getting fit for We're getting fit the Federal Reserve meeting, meeting yeah. next week. Uh, what are you on this morning? Honestly, you're seriously, kidding me. Folks, they <laughs> you just, are killing me this morning. John's entourage just sent me the lineup for, for July 27. John, we have the greatest set of bookers cool. on the planet. Extra tang this Friday. Please Spiked don't. Tang, Please clearly. don't. Hard tank. Hard <laughs> tank. Future's down at 10. I'm talking to them right now. Dear me. Friday. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo warns that the U.S. can't keep relying on Taiwan for semiconductors in a virtual speech to the annual Aspen Security Forum. Raimondo said Congress needs to pass legislation to support the domestic production of high-end computer chips. She called the $50 billion package, quote, a Sputnik moment for America. Progressive groups want Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to re recuse himself from legislation targeting big tech. They say he has a conflict of interest because of his daughter's work at Amazon and Meta platforms. 16 groups have been advocating for antitrust measures cracking down on tech giants. No comment yet from Schumer. And there is another sign that a recession may be on the horizon in the euro area. Private sector activity in the region unexpectedly shrank this month for the first time since the pandemic lockdowns of early 2021. A survey of purchasing managers by S&P Global dropped to a 17-month low. Manufacturing output fell and service sector growth almost stalled. In the UK, a new poll shows Foreign Secretary Liz Truss extending her lead over former Chancellor Rishi Sunak in the race to be the next Prime Minister. According to a YouGov survey of Conservative Party members, 62% said they would vote for Truss and 38% went for Sunak. An earlier poll this week had Truss leading by 19 points. An American Express posted second quarter revenue that soared 31% to a record that led the company to raise its forecast for full year revenue. Amex customers kept spending on travel despite those mass cancellations and long waits at the airport. Meanwhile, the company's expenses rose a more than expected 32%. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. research team at Bank America has the year-end recession, which they made a call on a few weeks ago, but it's a it's a slight recession, and a recession is not accompanied by high unemployment, which means it ought to right itself and come back out, but it's more the impact of the Fed raising rates and slowing economy. Brian Moynihan there, the chairman and CEO of Bank of America, catching up with David Weston. Always good to hear those two in conversation. Futures down a tenth of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, down 30 points with negative two tenths of 1%. Yields much lower this morning, down six basis points on a 10-year to 281, even lower over in Germany. We've got to talk about that data 
out of Europe, just terrible. Sub 50 on the PMIs well, in contraction, yields lower in Germany, Tom, on a two year it, by 22 the, the, basis the points. Bab, John, I've been remiss on this. Javier Blas comes to the rescue. You had the French bailout last week of energy, and this morning you have Germany's Uniper, U N I P E R, which I guess is basically a modern utility, if you can call it that, John. And I calculate off Blas's work that the bailout is 1.33 million per employee just as one metric of 11,000 employees as well. But again, it's government to the rescue. And $9.1 billion. My understanding, Tom, based on our reporting, is that they take a stake of 30%. That holding gives them a big enough holding to have veto rights on what we call important strategic decisions. I don't know. And later this year, there's going to be some big decisions to make, Tom. It's a new capitalism and speaks to the crisis at hand in continental Europe. Right now, he's been very hard to get through to because he has extra vacation days at Bloomberg. Damien Sassauer joins us right now, our chief emerging markets credit strategist. Damien, I'm watching Malaysia unwind. Philippine pesos, maybe the bank's got a level at 56 and on and on and on. What is the great unwind of EM as we go into this weekend? Well, Tom, one of the places that's been a relative safe haven has been Asia. I mean, Asian FX, if you notice today, amidst all that you're seeing in bond markets, Asian FX is the only market that's up here uh, on the day, right? So, I mean, you talk about the rupee, you talk about the Malaysian rupee, you talk about the Philippine peso. They have been a relative safe haven amidst the morass of emerging market currencies. And let's be very clear, emerging markets, there is no good news. I mean, as you rightly pointed out last week, an 18% year-to-date decline in the EM credit has wiped away over five and a half years of profits. If you look at EM local debt, seven and a half years of profits have been effectively wiped out by this year's performance. How big of a crisis is this to the Western world and specifically to the International Monetary Fund? Well, I mean, it's been relatively ignored by the developed market central banks. I mean, we know that the big four central banks, the Fed, the, the BOJ, the ECB, and the PBOC, are now scaling back their balance sheet. I mean, on a year-over-year -year basis, the combined balance sheet of the big four central banks is now down 4.7%, 4.7% year-over-year. Tom, the last time that happened was the end of 2018, and stock markets reacted really rather poorly off the back of it, down 20%. So, look, we expect some, 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 some weakness ahead for sure. We expect some... Uh, some gaps in the plumbing system for sure. As we're talking about weakness, let's talk about China because we've had a lot of conversation about just COVID zero and the impact that has had on the Chinese economy. The property sector, Damien, it seems like every morning I come in, I read in on what happened in Asia and it's that things have devolved even further, that things are getting even worse in a huge chunk of China's economy. Have we fully come to understand the risk of that? Kaylee, that is a great question, and it's not helping that China is actually censoring information around the mortgage crisis, which is going on there. But from my perspective, the whole pyramid is collapsing now, Kelly. I mean, the fact that you've got mortgage boycotts, I think, you know, over 100,000, um, you know, homeowners are not paying their mortgages because they never got a home off the back of it. You know, they pre-sale. So now it's expanding to the banking market. You hear ICBC, Agricultural Bank of China is feeling some pain off the back of it. Remember, the housing market in China, Kelly, it's... It's 40% of middle-class household wealth. It's 35% of the funding yeah. for local governments domestically. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big part of the economy, 25% of GDP. So then what's the policy response, Damien? I mean, how much do you have to ease and support to get that bleeding to stop? They need to incent local governments to come in and help finish some of these undeveloped projects. That's what needs to happen right now so that the projects are finished, so that people have their homes and they continue to pay their mortgages or they begin paying again. But right now, I mean, it's a far cry from seeing that and banks just don't want to lend in China. So that's really where the rubber meets the road. We need to get the banking community involved. And right now, there doesn't seem to be an incentive or a willingness on their part to do so. Damien, smells like a balance sheet recession coming up, doesn't it? It does. It does indeed. Look at you. I mean, look, I... For me, look, you know, I mean, you guys call me. It's a Friday summer morning. You know, the Yanks just got swept by the Astros. You know, I, I look, I'm wipe, wiping off the cobwebs here. <laughs> but if you want to talk balance sheets, I mean, again, you know, you look at the big four central bank balance sheets and the fact that they're getting smaller is never a good thing for money supply globally. It's never a good thing for emerging markets writ large. You always want to talk about sport. French Grand Prix this weekend. Damien, what are you looking for? I know you're into oh. F1 now. This is a change. Yeah, I have. Which I've, I've been watching Drive to Survive. I love Max Verstappen. I love Red Bull. I love Christian. I mean, look, Scuderia, I mean, you can't, Carl Sainz is my favorite racer, but, you know, Max Verstappen, you know, he's going to be hard to beat. I, I, I love it. I'd, I love like to, I'd like to get Horner on the program oh, and, and awesome. introduce Tom to Formula <laughs> One properly. We got him into football eventually, Damien. We can do that on Formula One, I'm sure. Damien Sasser. 
with the latest. Thank you, sir. TK, what do you think? Bit of F1 in your life? I, I, I don't get make it. That the, work. the late, great, wonderful Ken Pruitt, who taught me so much, tried to teach me F1. He couldn't convert you, Tom. Did, and Ken went down in flames. Tom, I got a ton of messages about Tottenham, Roma. It's in Israel. I know. I just priced it out. I mean, you know. You priced out the it's, ticket. It's on the road trip now. Well, no. The Mary, flight you know, or the actual ticket to get into the game? Mary, genius of all, priced it out for me. I went to okay. her and, and I think, you know, you and I need to do some research on the Levant. And right. uh, it's for the two of us, John Biscuits, we don't have to sit next to each other. $10,796. Return. Round trip. Business class. Business. And then you've got the hotel, you know? the price of the ticket. Yeah, Seems like a lot of money just to go for a friendly tom. It's a friendly. <laughs> we should be there for the start of the season in North London. That's what we should do. We should. We should go and is. watch Tottenham's first game. Where's Hy is is Hyphen near Tel Aviv? I don't even know. I'm not sure, Tom. I think I'm sure you can north. work that out. I, I can't believe you north. bothered the travel team all morning with trips we're never going to take. Mary and I are on, we're best buds. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Mary you thinks know. the world of you. I'm sure yeah. she does. Tom, the market is okay it's on the equity side of Mary. things. It's a friendly equity market over the last couple of it days. Is. We're down a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Look at the VIX. Come, John, Tom, the VIX, 22.95. Sure. Everyone out there into the weekend says the world's coming to an end in equities. Michael Hartnett, read it. He's right. Dan Ives He's, agrees. Hey, Michael Hartnett's great. What do you make of the bond market move? I don't have much on Silence. U.S. bonds. I, frankly, I'm looking at Germany. I mean, So I, am I. You know, yeah, but you started looking at 5 a.m. I started looking at 8.15. <laughs> well, I'm pleased you're catching up, Tom. The data just wasn't great at all, and I think what we're looking for now is to see what happens with the U.S. PMIs at 9.45, and we hope they stay in How positive many, territory wait, wait in the 50s and expansion. How many PMIs are there? Which ones, Tom? You mean like well, you've got the S&P Global PMI, then you've got the ISM survey as well. There's some <clears> different ones, Tom, in different places. Okay. Is that helpful? It's helpful. Kaylee, help me here. I have no idea what you want me to say, Tom. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just told listening that to you too. Haifa is in northern Israel yeah, on the it's Mediterranean. In Israel. Yes. Well, if you knew that, why did you ask? I, you wanted me out this morning. <laughs> it's I'm a just going to. I've got 30 seconds to myself. Just let me be. Futures are down by 0.06%. On the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, we're down 26, we're down two tenths of one percent off the back of the data in Europe, which was dreadful. Sub 50 That's a great on the composite data PMI. <laughs> Your euro's solid. weaker. I said, let me be. Just let me have my. You know, moment. John. Here's what it's about. Your you base, me speak? John. Why your can't base. You just let me speak. Your base. Get so excited to talk all the time. It's like anchoring with a child. <laughs> just wants to speak. Your base. Euro dollar, Tom. Take this out. 101.88. Where's the Dow? Where's the Dow? Where's the Dow? Dow Futures up 74. There we go. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. A lot of people writing in asking when's Bramo back to, to babysit you and I, Tom. Monday, I'm I clearly told. am not doing an adequate Monday, job. Monday, Well, you're just leaving us unleashed. <laughs> Have another hard <laughs> sell, Sir Kaylee. Futures down a tenth on the S&P. We're down a third of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. Yields come in by seven or eight basis points. A break of 280 this morning, 279.96. The big break, the big break lower in Germany. Bunds. Just rallying hard. We're down 22 basis points on a two-year in Germany, on a 10-year down 17. And I've said it how many times this morning, Tom, the data in Europe, just dreadful yeah, this morning. I, well, you know, we're making jokes about it, but it's not funny, and it's certainly not funny for the people of the continent of Europe. And I, frankly, John, I bring it right over to the United Kingdom. I think it rounds on there. And what I'll be watching, John, is currency markets is the litmus paper there, and I'm sorry they haven't broken down yet, but you've got to watch Euro dollar into the weekend. Euro can't get a bid even with a 50 basis point high, Tom, because I don't understand the reaction function of the ECB. I certainly don't understand what TPI is, and I've got no <clears> idea what happens with gas supply yeah. later this year. You put it all together, it's why people like Kit Jukes of Sokgen think that Euro is still unbuyable. Yeah, absolutely. We begin right now our coverage into a July 27th Federal Reserve meeting, which in sequence with the last one and maybe in sequence with the next one, is truly historic. A student of this, of the history of the nation's economics, and the action of it is the former Richmond Federal Reserve President, Jeffrey Lacker, and we're thrilled that Professor Lacker could join us this morning. Jeff Lacker, I want to go back to one of my heroes, a gentleman from Washington University at St. Louis, the laureate Douglas North, who codified the word ambiguity and also did a careful study of the dynamics, the movable parts of our economy. All of our listeners, all of our viewers are drowning now in the dynamics of our economic world. How do we get control of it? 
Fed has to do its job, get inflation down. Uh, it's the institution with unique uh, control over monetary conditions in the United States. Um, together with the fiscal authorities, uh, they drive inflation. And the Fed's got to do its job now uh, and uh, do what it takes to get inflation down. I think uh, Chairman Powell has been right in recent months uh, since March uh, to emphasize that maximum employment is going to be out of reach until we get inflation down. And we need to put uh, concerns about the labor market uh, and what it's doing a, a little bit to the side and focus on getting inflation down. That's going to take reducing spending growth, right. reducing nominal spend, and um, the labor market will play out as it will. Your shop codified economic history with Thomas Humphreys, one of my heroes. I've read every single page he's ever written. Right now, Thomas, Thomas Humphreys would be writing about comparing Volcker to Powell, Powell to Volcker. He's not Paul Volcker, right? So uh, Paul Volcker was a, um, a great central banker in an age of uh, monetary mystique, an age in which central banks deliberately cultivated some obscurity and a distance from the public. Uh, they didn't want to be in the headlines unless, you know, they wanted to choose when they'd be in the headlines. Um, we're in a different day and age. Getting inflation down revealed to central bankers around the world uh, the value of um, managing expectations and the value to that of being transparent and communicating about what they're about, what they're trying to do. Uh, Jay Powell strikes me as better suited for the age of central bank transparency than Paul Volcker in terms of personal demeanor. Uh, the one uh, big thing that Paul Volcker had was uh, the political, the backing of the political establishment in Washington and New York to get inflation down. They were fed up with it and they were willing to take the pain and he cultivated an appreciation of the pain that was needed uh, to, to, to withstand in order to get inflation down. And I think Jay Powell is, uh, seems to have uh, abundant um, political connections and uh, abundant skill in managing the Fed's political uh, connections. And so he, he seems pretty well suited on that grounds too. Jeffrey, this I is think, a delicate subject, <laughs> but you've touched on it. So let's go there. How political is this Fed right now? Uh, so... I think they understand that um, there's nothing that could damage their credibility more than sustained inflation. Um, you know, they can take all the hits they want on, on employment and the labor force and climate change and and uh, what have you. But uh, job number one is inflation. If they don't get that down, I think they're, they realize they're, they're political toast in some sense. So um, I think that's true of every, any Fed, no matter what people say about independence, I think it's true of every Fed. Are you convinced they're willing to tolerate a recession to get inflation I down? Think, yes, I do. And they should. Jeff, what kind of recession? Because the consensus right now is short and shallow. Do you share that, let's say, more constructive view of things? I, I'm tempted, given today's news, yesterday's news, to say a Mario Draghi recession, you know, whatever it takes. Um, because the... the um, the alternative uh, to let your foot up off the brake before inflation has come down, let it settle four and five percent. That's just a recipe for another recession down the road. That's a recession for prolonged pain, making the agony longer and longer, stretching out over years. That's not good for the American public. I think they realize that. So they're going to have to they ought to, what they ought to do is stick with it until they get inflation down to under three percent, say, uh, within spinning distance of two. OK. And um Go from there. Okay, so whatever it takes, what is it going to take? What rate on Fed funds? What rate on unemployment? Good question. So um, I think the historical record is clear that they need to get the real federal funds rate at or above zero. Uh, so that begs the question, right? So the real rate is the actual Fed funds, Fed funds rate minus expected near-term inflation. Our best reads of that are about 6%. You've got the Michigan survey at 5.2, the New York Fed Consumer Survey, which is great, very good um, methodology, at 6.8, split the difference at 6%. If near-term expectations of inflation stay at 6%, they're going to have to get there. If those near-term expectations start falling, then what we have in store is a rendezvous between the Fed funds rate and uh, expected inflation. Uh, but I, I doubt that expected expectations are going to fall to three and a half or four by year end. So I suspect they're gonna to have to go higher than that.
And how quickly would they need to get there? I mean, 6% is still a long way away, even with the supersized hikes we've already seen. I don't think the, um, I don't think slowing down the process does them a lot of good. Um, no matter what, whether they go, you know, 50s or 75s, they're still going to be in a situation where the effect on inflation is out into next year. They're going to have to make a judgment about when to stop without knowing whether they've done enough or not. Um, based on other indications and other calculations, like the one I, I cited. Um, and uh, so it, it, they might as well get get it done. Uh, they might as well get there fast. Jeff, do you look at the path back from this inflation to whatever's normal, 2 3%, let's not get into that now, is having a smoothness, a glide path, as Peter Orzag would call it, or is it kinked where we get to a point, we stop, we try to figure out how to lower inflation next, et cetera. You know, if the, if the Fed tightens enough, I think we'll just see a gradual decline down. I think it'll sag over a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I expect it to be relatively smooth. I don't have any reason to sure. expect any jolts. Absent other shocks, like more oil price um, problems and the like. Jeff, how would they respond, do you think, to that negative supply shock on the energy side? I'm, I'm interested in that, not just for the Federal Reserve, but maybe more so for the ECB on the gas side of things. I don't know if you followed that news yeah. conference yesterday with Lagarde, but I think we all failed to establish what their reaction function actually yeah. is and how they'd respond to a negative supply shock that pushed gas prices higher and potentially growth lower. This is a murky area. Because uh, oil price shocks tend to cause unemployment, people think, well, you need to ease, that's a reason to ease policy. But if you think about it more broadly, the, the central banks controlling the real interest rate, which is the incentive to save and delay consumption, delay spending to later. And if you get a supply shock, you want people to wait and consume later. So what you want to do is raise rates, uh, at least one argument goes. So there's a case that you know, it doesn't it doesn't mean uh, not staying the course on inflation. Interesting. Jeffrey, great to catch up. Jeff Lacker there, the former Richmond Fed president. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. Looking ahead to the Fed, that this Fed might have to tolerate what he called a draggy recession or whatever it takes recession yeah. to get inflation down. There's a call. They're doing it into 22 and particularly, John, they're doing it into the campaign of November 24. And unlike the sanity of the United Kingdom, I would suggest, John, that campaign starts the first Wednesday of November this year. Oh, Tom, you've raised an interesting one. You think this Fed will be deterred from hiking because of the midterms? I think this Fed will be a political Fed, as it always is, as they tell us they're not. Interesting, even with inflation always. printing where it is. Tom, do you want to join me on the nine? I've got Matt Hornback and Morgan Stanley, PIMCO's Jerome Schneider, Kate Moore of BlackRock. I can't. I got the CEO of wanna, Boston Beer on her. Join me for that? Have you actually got the Boston Beer CEO no. on radio? <laughs> I think I'd tune in for that. Last time he showed break. up with us a case of Sam Adams. It was good. And some hard seltzer, which I just... I've never had one. You haven't, Tom? No, it just... I look at it and go, I don't... It's I, like, I bought some of that white like claw, put it in the fridge, like, and it just no. it stayed there. Kaylee? I'll take it from you. I'll get it off your hands. What's your favorite hard seltzer? White claw, specifically it's black still, cherry flavor. Oh, there we white go. White claw, black cherry. Okay. And it just tastes like fizzy water with Thank a hint you, of black cherry. It's a little you, fun in it, you know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> fun on the weekend in Brooklyn, Tom, if yeah. you're interested. On White my patio. Claw, black my cherry. Discount nice. Target with patio your target furniture. patio furniture. Yeah. There's a lot of economics going into this. We're deep into research Saving this weekend, a segment. John, on hard tang. Is that right, Tom? <clears throat> I think I'm convinced you already have hard tang in the morning. Well, well yeah, that's besides the point, but it's homemade. Is it? Futures are down by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down I don't by like the mango a third either. of 1%. Tell Anne-Marie I don't like the mango. You have a choice now. You can stick she with Bloomberg from, Radio at 9 o'clock. She brought back Jetta, Saudi Arabia. She brought back some Listen to Tom's stories and, about you know. hard tang, or you can tune in for some market coverage on Bloomberg TV at 9 Eastern. We're getting competitive, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> or you can tune in for Real Yield later. Tom's anchoring oh, a special good. summer edition of Bloomberg Real Yield with Tom King coming up at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Thought you'd be excited for that, Tom. Looking forward. Just good, good, good. I'm, I'm, a, I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg. 
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Fed Chair Jerome Powell probably will slow the pace of interest rate hikes after a second straight 75 basis point increase next week. That's according to economists surveyed by Bloomberg. They expect policymakers to raise rates a half point in September and then shift to quarter point hikes at the last two meetings of the year. Trump insiders told the January 6th committee the former president ignored pleas to call off the mob start storming the U.S. Capitol. The panel held a televised primetime hearing Thursday night. Members cast the former president's inaction as a desperate final ploy in his struggle to hold on to the presidency. And the White House is confident that President Biden will avoid the worst of the coronavirus thanks to vaccines and a therapeutic drug. The president is experiencing mild symptoms and has begun taking Pfizer's Paxlovid. He will isolate at the White House whilst continuing his duties. In New York State, the Republican candidate for the governor was attacked at a campaign event. Officials say a man with a pointed weapon tried to drag Congressman Lee Zeldin to the ground before being subdued. No one was hurt. The attack took place outside the city of Rochester. And Verizon has cut its full-year profit and revenue forecast. The largest U.S. wireless carrier is trying to keep up with rivals who have made gains through heavy phone discounts. On Thursday, AT&T alarmed industry watches with some a warning that some customers are starting to delay paying their phone bills. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. People are starting to buy less goods, but they're paying more money. This is going to start to weigh on inventory adjustments, which is going to weigh on GDP. This is not good for profit margins. This is not good for earnings. Things are starting to slow down more materially than maybe what many uh, many in the markets are thinking. Your first fixed income brief for the weekend. James Karen over at Morgan Stanley. I urge you to see that in its entirety on Bloomberg Digital as we all reframe into a Fed meeting on July 20th. Kayla Lines with me in for a Bramaritz. I'm told a lot of emails. She's had a wonderful time and is like halfway back from Kathmandu. I don't even, you know, I'll be honest. I don't even know what the path is, whether it's through Qatar or whatever, Kaylee. Right now, and this is really important, I line up Kenneth Rogoff with his book, The Curse of Cash. It's one of the most courageous books written in the last number of years. There's our Steve Engel out of Hong Kong and the courage he has done in reporting some of the challenges of the Pacific Rim. And in securities analysis, there is Richard Greenfield, who was tarred in feathers years ago with a small upstart called Vonage. It wasn't funny at the time. Now we can look back with joy and we're thrilled that one of the leaders on media, Rich Greenfield, joins us today with Lightshed Partners on the challenges of Mr. Musk and Chancery Court. Rich, just as a, as a beginning point, do the earnings today matter? I mean, they matter from the standpoint of it's yet another signal that the online ad market is slow. And you saw it from Snapchat last night. You've seen it from Twitter. There are now just a building series of signs that the economy is slowing and advertising is slowing, whether that's inflation-driven or just overall broader economic weakness. It definitely, there, right. look, there's very specific Twitter challenges with Musk, but the overall macro environment is right. clearly weighing. We'll see the big bellwethers in Google and Facebook next week, but this is certainly not, um, these, these are negative data points, both of them for investors right now. Well, in this Rich, I got to rip up the script here. Let's jump over to next week. Are we going to see the big boys and frankly, including the Amazon advertising model, are they going to be diminished as well? I mean, look, Google has been talking about YouTube bearing some pressure. I think there's no doubt the connected TV ad market is certainly slowing. I think you're going to hear that, whether it's from Fox or Paramount. Like, I think everywhere you look, connected TV is slowing. The TV market, especially local TV, is starting to slow. The economy is weakening from the standpoint of advertising. Companies are, you know, companies are seeing top line growth slow. What do they do? They cut back on marketing spend. This is nothing, this is not a new. I mean, you and I, Tom, have lived through multiple cycles over decades. Like 
this is what companies do. When things start to slow, they cut their marketing spend. There's yeah. nothing shocking about it. The question is only how long will it last and how bad will it be? Is this a deep, dark recession through 23 where ad spend gets crushed? Or is this more of a shorter term phenomenon and we bounce back in 23? And that's, I think that's the big question we don't know mm -hmm. right now, but I definitely think you'll see Facebook, or sorry, Meta, I keep saying Facebook. <laughs> we will see Meta certainly talk about a slowdown, yeah. in, in, in a continued slowdown in ad revenue and probably give relatively underwhelming Q3 guidance. I don't think it's bad as Snapchat, but I don't think it's going to be a great, you okay. know, a great outlook right. for them. Well, for Rich, to bring it back to Twitter, they did talk in the statement about those advertising headwinds, but they also said part of it's reflective of uncertainty related to the acquisition of Elon Musk. What is your base case about what the verdict will be in that Delaware court in October? Is he going to be forced to buy this company for 54.20 a share? We really do believe he's going to be forced to buy this company for 54.20, Kaylee. He signed, his, he signed this agreement. When the, the case in Delaware, which is going to be litigated on an expedited basis, he already lost the push to push this out. I think the judge, my guess is the judge is going to look at this and go, the entire Elon Musk case essentially rests on this question of bots. And did Twitter disclose the proper amount of bots? The problem with that, Kaylee, is when you read the merger agreement, it never talks about bots. There's no discussion of bots. It just relies on Twitter's public filings. And if you read Twitter's public filings, it says, this is how we this is how we count bots or this is how we count real users, but we could be wrong. So I, I think when you actually read the documents, it's very hard to see how Elon, which is feels like he's got buyer's remorse. He just doesn't want to buy it anymore, yeah. whether it's the market, well, the environment, I have no idea. Well, to that point, Rich, what happens to a company if someone is forced to buy it who doesn't want it? Well, first of all, it's happened before. The, the specific performance, which is being forced to close a transaction that you signed back in the financial crisis, there is precedent for being forced to buy a company. That's his problem, not Twitter's. <laughs> Rich Greenfield, very quickly here, and I want you to take a broader Walter Pizek, Rich Greenfield view. Is there profit in streaming? Is it a durable business, or do they compete it all away, spending $200 million on the gray man? Uh Tom, it's an, a, an excellent question. I think the way to answer it is right now, you are seeing one company make a lot of money, which is Netflix. Netflix is generating six, seven billion dollars of EBITDA, is generating a billion dollars of free cash flow, and is going to make dramatically more free cash flow next year. Everybody else, whether we're talking about Disney or, I mean, Peacock is losing two and a half billion dollars a year. Paramount Plus lost a billion in the last two quarters. Everyone is just drowning in red right. tape right now. I mean, the, the, this is like a, a black hole of streaming because there's too many companies competing and they don't generate a significant amount of yeah. time spent in streaming. Netflix is 30% of all time spent streaming on a connected TV. YouTube is 20%. Everybody else is tiny. And that's the problem is they're all spending billions upon billions of dollars and they're not right. getting substantial viewership. Yeah. That's the problem. I got 10 more questions in no time. Rich Greenfield, thank you so much for joining us with Walter Thanks Parson for having me. at Light Shed uh, Partners doing work. Again, we protect the copyright of our analysts and our guests. Get it from Light Shed uh, Partners there as well. Uh, Kaylee, uh, seriously, I want to look at crypto out to next uh, Tuesday as well. There's a back and forth right now. Who has the upper hand? Crypto developing as a business or people really pushing against it? Right now, it seems that a lot of that leverage has gotten <clears throat> washed out and we've actually seen a breaking out of the trading range it has been in really for the past month. We are now comfortably above $23,000. So that's, of course, something we'll continue to dig into. And I know this is probably not what you're expecting from me, Tom, because you know I always push crypto. But this bond market is what has my attention this morning. We're down 23 yeah. basis points on the two-year German bond yield, 20 basis points on the 10-year BTP, and it is a weaker euro, even though we got a 50 basis point hike from the ECB yesterday. And 2.81% on the U.S. 10-year showing those concerns about economics. And I believe John Farrell, let me get it up here, Kaylee, because of course I haven't looked where Farrell's all over it. 9.45 a.m., we will get the S&P global PMI numbers, which... That uh, will make a lot of sense. I think, Kaylee, another thing we have to look at, um, <coughs> excuse me, is West Texas Intermediate coming right up and then right back down. $95 a barrel is not 120 is it? It is far from it. You're seeing a cooling in oil. <clears throat> we're also seeing a cooling in wheat and corn because we're looking at potentially a green yeah. agreement being Thank signed you. in Istanbul later today. 
the energy price pressures, the food price pressures that people have been feeling, it, there are signs that that's going to come down. And I wonder what that makes that's for central banks impressive. like the Fed responding to headline inflation. Well, Thank you, Tom. Farm I've spent a week with you. You know, I well, learned something. Well, well, please, Farm Girl from Fargo would have nailed that. You know, days, <laughs> days ago, corn, seriously. One of the stories this week, plunging. Next week, a rumored return of Lisa Abramowitz, where she will co-host Farm Journal. Stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg.